morning. I'm Suzanne Maloney, Vice President and Director of Foreign Policy here at the Brookings Institution. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the fall conference of our Center for the United States and Europe, entitled Ukraine, the West, and the World, Breaking Point or Transformational Moment. We're delighted to have so many joining us here in the audience in Washington in our Falk Auditorium and online from around the world. And I'm looking forward to what promises to be a very timely and important discussion. Since Russia launched its invasion of Ukraine 18 months ago, the war has had disastrous consequences for the Ukrainian people and has created significant ripple effects across Europe and around the world, reigniting debates about European security, the future of NATO and the transatlantic relationship, the impact of domestic politics on foreign policy, and the trajectory of great power competition. We're fortunate today to have a remarkable group of wise experts to discuss these issues. We'll start with a conversation on lessons from the post-Berlin Wall period. This was a rare plastic moment in history where civil societies and political leaders around the, the globe grasped the chance to reshape the world after the Cold War. We're living through what appears to be another transformational moment in Europe, but where it will lead remains unclear. Speaking to this issue will be Oxford historian Timothy Garton Ash, author of the recent book, Homelands, A Personal History of Europe, and our own Fiona Hill, Senior Fellow in the Center for the United States and Europe here at Brookings, moderated by the inimitable New Yorker's Susan Glasser. Following this discussion right now, uh, Brookings Visiting Fellow Asla Aydin Tashbash will moderate a panel focusing on Europe's path between Russia, China, and the United States, the global ramifications of the Russia-Ukraine war, and what the sharpening U.S.-China rivalry means for the Euro-Atlantic security order. We'll con conclude with a conversation on democratic governance and the resilience of democracies in the face of transformational global disruptions and contested Western he hegemony. Moderate, moderated by Constanza Steltemuller, the director of our Center on the United States and Europe, this discussion will tackle the question of how governments can balance the imperatives of domestic and foreign policy in the face of serious crises. Finally, I'd like to note that we are streaming live and on the record. We'll be taking questions from viewers via the email events at brookings.edu or via social media using the hashtag US Europe. We'll also have a microphone going around the room for those of you here in the Falk Auditorium. I'll now hand the mic over to Susan Glasser. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Suzanne, uh, and thank you to Constanza for organizing this and uh, for all of you for spending part of your day with us. I have to say I personally have just been looking forward to this because how often is it that you get to start your day uh, with a conversation between Timothy Gartnash and Fiona Hill? So I think we're all very lucky that they've uh, joined us this morning. And I want to thank Suzanne for starting with this idea about 1989, because I do think there's a big frame for the discussion that we are having and that we need to have about what are the consequences, what does it mean, this uh, war in Europe. You'll often hear it said, well, this is the largest land war in Europe since World War II. This is a profound challenge to the European security order and, and things uh, along that vein. And yet I, I think the way we should start this conversation is to talk about do we even have a way, a framework for thinking about uh, the longer term consequences of this moment. And, you know, I remember a few years ago, uh, somebody said to me, well, 1989, just might have been the best year of any of our lives. We just didn't know it at the time. <laughs> and in, in that spirit, it, Timothy, I want to start with you because you've written this, this remarkable book, and Fiona and I both have copies here uh, because we shouldn't leave it to the author to shamelessly promote his work. Uh, when we can do it for him, I can tell you it is actually a gripping read, and it is the story in many ways of the spirit of 1989 and what we got right and also what we didn't get right. So I think it's worth stepping back from the immediate crisis of the war in Ukraine for a minute to kind of begin with a question to you, Timothy, about, you know, how we can apply those lessons to this moment. Yeah, well, listen, thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here um, with, in conversation with two people whose work I very much admire um, and not having to boost one's own book because you've done it for me. Um, it's so, on sale, by the way, here at the Brookings Bookstore. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so Tony Judd wrote a book, a famous book called Post-War, Defining a Post-War Period. This book 
it covers particularly a period that I call post-wall, which gives a title to this session. By the way, I'm struck that here in Washington, you have to explain it's the Berlin Wall. <laughs> I mean, for us Europeans, you know, what other wall is there? The, the one Trump didn't build to Mexico? Which walls are we talking about? And I think the post-wall period goes from the 9th of November 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, to the 24th of February 2022. I think the full-scale invasion of Ukraine ends that period. And that period, like a, like a game of European football, is a game of two halves. So in the first half, you have this quite extraordinary spread of freedom, of democracy, and enlargement of the geopolitical West, right? I mean, think about it. The uh, EU and NATO. EU 12 members, NATO 15 in 1989. 2007, uh, 27 members of EU, 25 of NATO. I mean, incredible step forward to Europe, Poland, free. Second half, starting with Putin's annexation of two chunks of Georgia and the global financial crisis, it's pretty much downhill all the way. It's a downward turn. It's a cascade of crises ending with the beginning of the largest war in Europe since 1945. Um, let me just quickly pick out three lessons, if I may, and then we'll go into the conversation. First of all, and this, this touches on what you said about 1989, the mistake we made was to think that was normal. That was the way history was going to go. Actually, it was a one in a million example of historical luck, of what Machiavelli calls fortuna, right? Uh, and the mistake me, what we made was, was, to put it most simply, the fallacy of extrapolation, right? We took the way things had gone through to 2007, namely very well, and said that's the way it's going to continue. We took history with a small H, which is always a product of the interaction between deep structure and process on the one hand and conjuncture, contingency, chance, you know, collective will and individual leadership on the other, and turned it into history with a capital H, the Hegelian process of the inev inevitable uh, progress towards freedom. But freedom isn't a process. Freedom is always a struggle, as the Ukrainians are reminding us. So that's lesson number one. Lesson number two, looking back, and this is very much Fiona's territory, I would say that the decline of the Russian slash Soviet empire has been one of the great drivers of European history for the last 40 years and is probably going to be preoccupying us for the next 40, right? And history teaches us something about declining empires, which is they don't like it. <laughs> Ask the British. <laughs> Ask the French. Ask the Portuguese. West European colonial powers spent 30 years after 1945 trying to defend their colonial possessions in often brutal wars, right? So when the largest remaining empire in Europe, the Russian Soviet land empire, softly and suddenly vanishes away in just three years in 1989 to 1991, we shouldn't have assumed that was the end of the story. And therefore, when that empire started doing what declining empires do, which is trying to strike back, I mean, you could already say Transnistria, you could already say Chechnya, but big time Georgia 2008, above all 2014. 2014 for me is the turning point at which the West failed to turn. We should have learned that lesson of history. And I would argue if we'd had a much different and stronger response 2014, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in today. Uh, third quick lesson, Susan, we have to learn from our successes as well as from our failures. And the biggest single success of this period was the double eastward enlargement of the geopolitical West, EU and NATO. And the Ukrainians have understood this perfectly. If you talk to Olga Stefanishina, who is the Ukrainian Minister for Euro-Atlantic Integration on Zoom, she has behind her a, a backdrop which shows the symbols of the EU and NATO interlinking through UA, i.e. the symbol for Ukraine. I, it's always both. 
it's always, and by the way, that goes back to Václav Havel and Lech Wałęsa. It's both. It's NATO and EU. It's Euro-Atlantic integration. And therefore, we now have this, you know, that process stalled for 15 years after 2008, basically. And suddenly we have again, thanks to the war, a really big, exciting, strategic agenda, which is about a new big double eastward enlargement of the geopolitical West, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, and the Western Balkans. And um, so I think you know, it, it, it's important to learn from your successes as well as from your failures. Yeah, it's, uh, it's imp- uh, interesting that you make that point. I just came back from Tbilisi, which is one of the only places in the world where you see uh, uh, on the street graffiti, in addition to uh, lots of graffiti about, uh, you know, doing bad things to Russia, literally EU symbols, uh, you know, as graffiti on the walls in Tbilisi, expressing aspirations that may or may not happen anytime soon. Fiona, who also, I should say, has her own terrific book. Uh, I'm sure many of you here have read it. There's nothing for you here, Uh, but there's something for her here. Um, (laughs) uh, She and I, we have had this conversation a number of times, but I think I, I haven't, we haven't talked about this recently, so I'm really curious, in light of what Timothy is saying in, in terms of being humble about what we didn't get right about 1989, okay, let's say that we've now recognized that this is a moment, this is one of those inflection points, as, as President Biden often refers to it, since the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. I'm curious, given the huge response that you have actually seen from Europe, Uh, in terms of support for Ukraine. Certainly in the United States, we're now at nearly $50 billion in U.S. military assistance, uh, more than close to $80 billion overall uh, in committed assistance. That's running uh, ahead uh, in current dollars, even of the three-year Marshall Plan. I mean, it's an extraordinary investment. We don't even really have a consensus terminology in what to call this. What is it that we are doing right now uh, to support Ukraine. As you know, there's a huge fight unfolding here in Washington, I think, around this question. Uh, In the White House, if you ask them, and I did this recently, uh, would you call this a proxy war? Uh, They reacted as if I had just, like, punched them in the stomach uh, because that is not something that that they want to call it. Uh, You and I have talked before. Uh, Is it actually, according to Vladimir Putin, the early stages of World War III? Uh, what do you think it is that's happening right now? And what, you know, is, is it important for us to, to sort of name and understand the moment in that way? Well, thanks very much, Susan. And um, I just want to commend um, Timothy as well on the fabulous book that's now sitting next to me, a chair, which it deserves its own chair here. Uh, and the, you know, there's one actually a point at the very beginning of the book that I think actually helps to encapsulate what we're talking about here. You point out, um, you know, through your own personal experiences and interactions, that everybody has a different year zero. And everybody, you know, would have a different year nine in their minds. And I think that this is kind of part of the issue that we're dealing with. We're not even sure who the we is, you know, when we're starting to unpack all of this and talk about it, because so many different people, depending on their perspectives, you bring out very well in the book, have different um, starting points. Um, If I think about that 1989, that's when Susan and I met. We were actually in a Russian history class with Richard Pipes, uh, and I think it was one of the ones about the, you know, Russia under the old regime and the Russian Empire. And we, we, we interacted in a number of classes. I just started my master's um, program, and Susan was uh, wrapping up um, her undergraduate, but we both had an interest in, you know, where all this was heading. I got a degree in Soviet studies that was defunct, you know, a few months later. And I remember that as I was sitting, you know, in the audience waiting to get my degree in my master's in Soviet studies, sitting on the podium was Edward Shevardnadze, who was getting an honorary degree. I know he was looking as bemused as the rest of us were. I mean, he's the former, you know, Soviet... Well, I think he was still actually technically the Soviet foreign minister, replete with new thinking, trying to figure out how to get out of the Cold War. And within months, he would be the president of an independent Georgia and, you know, as confused as everybody else about where the rest of the things were heading. Um, So this was a kind of a time when nobody knew what trajectory they were on. He had no idea uh, that he was sort of sitting there. He was obviously pretty bemused, you know, why is he getting uh, this, you know, award? Everybody was thinking he'd ended the Cold War, but he was just beginning on uh, an odyssey of his own. And it's that whole kind of 1989 
you know, for some countries was uh, an opening to something that they hoped would be new. But, you know, if you think about the metaphor of Georgia, where you've just come from, it was just one civil war after another, one, you know, kind of conflict after another, one aspiration that was, um, you know, basically never achieved. And Georgia still today is racked uh, by so many of these ghosts of the past. And I remember um, one of Shevardnadze's key advisors saying to me, you know, the problem is that nobody thinks of us as real countries. We're just shadows. We're shadows cast by the old Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. And we're shadows for you because you don't know, you know, what to think about us. And part of the reason that we're here today unpacking all of this is that we continue to look at everything through the lens of Russia. You know, we talked about when uh, the Soviet Union fell apart of Russians in the near abroad, 25 million Russians, but they were just Russian speakers. I mean, you know, most of us here speak English, but we're not all English. Um, Timothy is. I was born in England, but, you know, we've all got, um, you know, very fluid identities. And English is a language that, you know, is, is pretty ubiquitous everywhere. And everybody who speaks English doesn't identify themselves as English. It's the dominant language in India, next to Hindi. It's the language of Canada and New Zealand and Australia, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so this is, um, you know, partly why did we just think that everybody was a Russian? Uh, in, you know, the so-called near abroad. We didn't think of English people living in um, Rhodesia that became Zimbabwe or South Africa. You know, as English, we ultimately started to think of them as South Africans, you know, etc. So, I mean, part of the reason that we've got today to this kind of confusion about where we are is that we never really uh, got a grip of uh, that era of 1989 about where it might be heading. And now, you know, we keep trying to give ourselves satisfying explanations. But, you know, if you think about countries like Finland in this context, and as, you know, the, uh, we, we constantly talk about United States support uh, for Ukraine, but proportionally the Baltic states, Finland, you know, other countries are giving so much more support, proportional, you know, to their populations and to their GDP, that the Baltic states are all out. Why? Because in 1939, they got snatched by Stalin, having been, you know, independent uh, for the whole interwar period. And, I mean, Timothy writes about this in some of, you know, the early books, you know, The Magic Lantern, you know, the whole of Eastern Europe trying to go west again. It's not that the west went east. It's that most of Eastern Europe tried to go west again, particularly the countries that had had their independence, Poland, the Baltic states. Finland, in 1939, got invaded by the Soviet Union again. And why have the Finns joined NATO? Because they're all in. They know where this is heading. 1989 for them did seem like an aberration. And although the Finns were embracing the European Union and basing their, embracing their independence, they always had in the back of their minds that history would come back again with another nine, like 1939. So they were always raring to go. So I think that we ought to ourselves take a pause you know, when we look through our own lens at 1989 and where we've been and, you know, how we feel about the war in Ukraine, a lot of other countries are all in because, as uh, Timothy said, they have a different year zero or they have a different year nine. They think about a lot of the, these um, dates in different historical patterns. Yeah, and I think that's a really important jumping off point then for where we are today here because it, it does look different in Washington than it looks in Europe. And so I do, I want to ask both of you this question about there isn't the same level of consensus. There has been remarkable support on the one hand. If you look at uh, polls, Americans have been very supportive of Ukraine, although that has ebbed over time in terms of support for specific amounts of military assistance. But I don't think there's a consensus in our society about what we're doing. And of course, it looks very different if you have a thousand mile border. Uh, with Russia than it does here in the U.S. And so I, I do want to ask both of you this question of how do you think about what it is that is our commitment to Ukraine right now? Yeah, one start with Well, um, I'm, I'm sure many of you um, might have picked up uh, the New York Times uh, today. Maybe not everybody you know, watching um, on C-SPAN might have done so, but I would actually commend um, a, a long piece by Thomas Friedman uh, and also by the editorial board today, which I think, you know, lays it out, you know, very clearly. I mean, the point is that we may not think that Ukraine, you know, matters to us sitting um, over here and that we can be, you know, fairly feckless in the way that we debate it. But the way um, that we present ourselves in the United States matters a lot. Uh, Timothy made, you know, reference back um, again to, you know, kind of World War II. Uh, but um, Susan and I actually exchanged a glance as you were talking about this, because for Putin, this is a hundred years war. He's going back to World War I, and he repeats this over and over again. He might have thrown us all off the scent by talking about World War II and Nazis in Ukraine, but he's also constantly talking about 1917, 
And um, I know there's a few people in the audience, you know, who will have noted all of that um, as well. You know, when uh, Mr. Prigozhin was marching on Moscow, uh, for example, uh, Putin talks about 1917, the stab in the back of the Russian Revolution um, for uh, the Russian Empire during World War I. He talks repeatedly about the fact that Ukraine is a kind of an abomination, uh, a Frankenstein country, a country that shouldn't exist, and that Lenin and the Bolsheviks invented as a way of creating uh, the Soviet Union. And, you know, as, as they, they say from previous 100 years war, you never know you're in one until you get towards the end of it. I mean, we're 100 years on now. None of us are old enough to, you know, basically remember 1914 or 1917, even though we might um, have links into that. But that's the kind of shadow that is uh, cast all over uh, this. And that's what it makes it really, you know, extremely difficult uh, to deal with because Putin is making a battle for history here. And we have to, and this is why books like this are really so good about putting things into perspective, we have to stop him from weaponizing history. And if we look at our own history in the United States, it took a very long time for the United States to become independent. Putin's always talking about Crimea belongs to Russia because they snatched it in 1783. They did it in April 1783. It wasn't until September 1783, sorry for the history lesson here, but I've been trying to perfect my elevator speech on how you try to explain to people, you know, why this uh, uh, really matters. And obviously, the elevator's gone up and down many floors by now. Uh, but in, it wasn't until sept September 1783 that the United States was recognized as a fully independent state. And Florida wasn't in the U.S. at that point. Alaska most certainly wasn't. The one place where we do have a border uh, with Russia and can see it from our you know, bedroom windows and all the rest of it. Uh, but, you know, it took the United States that long you know, from uh, 1776 to 1783 to get itself in order, and it didn't have all of its borders in place. So basically, Ukraine is like the young United States. It's like any other European country that's constantly refighting for its independence and refighting, you know, for its borders. And if we let the, um, uh, you know, basically Ukraine down now, we're letting ourselves down because many people came to the United States defense. And if we do think back to World War II, we're having the same debates about our homeland, our original homeland of the United Kingdom. Imagine if we hadn't stood up and kept helping Churchill. That's why the UK is all in, because they do recognize Zelensky as another Winston Churchill trying to use his networks to keep support. I mean, this is unfortunately, whether we like it or not, as Timothy said before, a replay of all of those fights that we've had in the past. And, you know, people may call us all hawks or say that we're reactionary. But there are so many times we have to stand up and be counted. We might not like it. We might like to have our comfortable life back. But unfortunately, that's not you know, the situation that we're in right now. This is one of those moments where you have to take a stand. Um, one, one comment on the past and one on the future. Uh, Fiona, you, you, you pointed out that everybody in this room speaks English, but they're not all English. Th this is a point I made to Vladimir Putin in 1994 at a conference in St. Petersburg. Putin was then the deputy mayor of St. Petersburg, and famously he piped up and said, there are territories that have historically always belonged to Russia, and the Russian Federation has to look after them. And he specifically mentioned Crimea, and he mentioned the 25 million, the 25 million Russians. And I actually came back and I said, if England <laughs> claimed all the people who spoke English, we would be the largest country in the world. Um, um, he didn't quite like that answer, I think. Um, but it's, but it, it is very revealing that he was already thinking of how do you get the empire back three years after the end of the Soviet Union. Don't tell me NATO enlargement, which happens five years later, is the cause of Putin's attitude to Ukraine. And... Um, and, and, and in, in the way he has thought about restoring Russian greatness, there is a huge missed opportunity, which you can think about by taking the English comparison, right? So in 2013, the Kiev International Institute of Sociology, which does regular polling in Ukraine, found that 80% of Ukrainians had a positive general attitude to Russia, 80%. After the full-scale invasion, 2%. Vladimir Putin has destroyed the Russian world. And, and there was that possible... I, I visited a bookshop in central Kiev uh, earlier this year where they're collecting Russian language books and pulping them 
in order to send the money to support the Ukrainian armed forces. Anything in Russian. I mean, I saw there were piles of books in the cellar of this bookshop. <laughs> and, uh, while I was there, a guy came in carrying some bundles of books, and he said, um, um, I've got 50 volumes of Lenin. Have you got space for 50 volumes of Lenin? And they said, yes, bring them in. On we go. So that tells you. So, so there's a tragedy in there for Russian culture. Whereas, of course, England, I mean, we made huge mistakes, but because it was a much softer transition to the post-colonial, our culture and our literature has been infinitely enriched by post-colonial writers, Arundhati Roy, Salman Rushdie, J.M. Kutsey, you can go on and on. So there's a Russian tragedy in there. Now, to the future. I spent half my time on Ukraine. I've been three times in the last nine months. A year ago, my biggest worry was wavering, fading, uncertain European support. I was particularly worried about Germany. I was worried about Italy. Today, by far my biggest worry is fading U.S. support. Basically, I mean, there are some uncertain customers in Europe, Viktor Orban's Hungary, obviously, Slovakia after the election at the end of this month, Bulgaria, Greece. Basically, Europe is solid. Basically, Europe is going to stick with it. But, of course, militarily, it depends on the United States. And if you look at the opinion polling here, if you look at the debates on Congress about budget, above all, if you think of the prospect of a second Trump presidency. I mean, that would be a disaster in so many ways, but it would be an absolute catastrophe for Ukraine. And I don't know what Fiona thinks on this, but it seems to me clear that Putin is waiting and working and hoping for a Trump victory. Uh, so that it, we really have a task, Susan, all of us, to make the case to the American public uh, now, 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 Fiona made part of the case, which is this is what we're about. It's sticking up for countries fighting for their freedom and independence. But there's also a geopolitical case, which is this. You want to pivot to Asia? You think your biggest problem is China? Then you've got to help Ukraine to win. Number one, that's the biggest deterrent to Xi Jinping, not to have a go at Taiwan. Number two, you then have the largest, most combat-hardened army in Europe, in Ukraine, the second largest in Poland. Germany is spending 2% of its GDP, which gives it, if it sticks to it, um, the third largest defense budget in Europe, and a much weakened Russia. So actually, you have a new burden-sharing within the transatlantic lines between Europe and uh, the United States, where Europe is doing much more for its own defense, and therefore you can free up resources to meet the challenge in Asia, and you will have asserted our commitment to international order. But I think it's, you know, it's a case we need to keep making. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting that you make this point. I was just last night speaking with a senior Republican senator who's a, a supporter of Ukraine, and he said exactly this. He said he was pleading, actually, with the administration to reframe the current, they, there's a $24 billion uh, supplemental appropriation that they've asked Congress to pass. It's not clear. We all know what's happening in Congress this week, whether that will happen or not. But his point was, this is about your pivot to Asia as well. It is about Taiwan as much as it is about Ukraine. And that's how you should be talking about it with Congress and with the American people. So I think that's a very resonant point. But Fiona, I do think it's important to give us your take on just this week, Vladimir Putin basically endorsed Donald Trump uh, once again. Uh, you know, it's not a surprise, perhaps, but you you saw this firsthand. Are we right to assume that Donald Trump? Uh, you know, he says he will end the war in 24 hours. Uh, he didn't even believe. He essentially adopted the Russian view of Ukraine, correct? That Ukraine was not a real state. In uh, uh, Marie Yovanovitch's memoir, she actually recounts a meeting in the Oval Office with Petro Poroshenko, the previous president of Ukraine, that she was present at with Donald Trump in the spring of 2017, uh, in which Trump says, basically, that Ukraine is not a real country and that Crimea never belonged to Ukraine, and therefore, uh, why should he care about that? He said that to the president of Ukraine, correct? So what do we 
take well, from that? Look, um, I mean, we take from that, um, you know, what is pretty obvious. And, um, you know, as I said before, um, you know, people like to use as their, well, Russia and Putin like to use as their grand zero 1783. Well, there'll be a lot of countries around the world who wouldn't be on a map in 1783. Germany included, Italy, you know, the United States uh, without Florida, which actually might be a good thing sometimes, you know, from some people's perspective, I guess, you know, kind of when you look at uh, its dispositive uh, role in um, elections. I can uh, see we're going to get a headline yeah, out of this. I'm gonna, yeah, I know. I just, I just thought I would throw that out there just to kind of, you know, throw a bit of chum into the water there, you know, for uh, a little bit of drama. But, I mean, look, think of, if, you, if you think that through, you know, it, it obviously, um, you know, gets us to a point about where do you stop on things like this. And, you know, being ignorant of history is not an excuse. And President Trump was shockingly ignorant of, even of American history, just to be, you know, very clear about that. So, you know, he didn't know where the United States was in 1783. Perhaps as a resident of Florida, he would have been a bit more hesitant to make that comment had he, you know, been able to kind of go back in time and think about all of this. But, you know, the, the, the other point um, that, that we're making here is, um, you know, President um, Trump also um, prided himself, and actually in this case rightly so, on his intervention on North Korea, because he did head off a crisis on, uh, on North Korea by some, you know, I would just uh, say some pretty uh, creative um, forms of diplomacy, which wasn't uh, palatable for everyone, but we were on the point of a, a real disaster there. What else has been happening this week? Vladimir Putin's been meeting with Kim Jong-un, and that also should be pretty sobering. Because if we think that, you know, Russia is not of consequence in the Asia-Pacific, we've got to think again. And actually, what's a really astounding uh, part of this whole conflict is that the two Koreas have taken sides. The North most uh, uh, definitively now uh, with uh, Putin. And Kim Jong-un, you know, is a kind of a model for Putin. Putin's gone kind of rogue, in particular in the way that he handles nuclear weapons, you know, etc. And South Korea is all in also on supporting Ukraine. I mean, if, if we, we keep getting focused on just, you know, China and Taiwan, but there's a lot else going on here. For South Korea, this is extraordinarily threatening, what's happening in uh, Ukraine. Because before, you know, we got into this war, of course, all of our discussions were hoping that there would be some negotiated solution to the division of the Korean Peninsula. Instead, many people start positing the division of the Korean Peninsula as a model for Ukraine. Or, or now the idea that North Korea could invade South Korea and forcibly uh, reunify uh, the Korean Peninsula. Japan, another country that is completely fixed on assisting uh, Ukraine, you know, mostly by diplomatic, but other financial and, you know, other means uh, through sanctions, because Japan worries about not just its territorial dispute um, with Russia, but all of the claims that ch uh, China has on its territory. India is in a very equivocal place, and we'll probably, you know, hear um, about this in uh, one of the other panels, but India has um, disputes with Pakistan, uh, with China in uh, the Himalayas. Uh, the way that Russia is and Putin constantly threatens to set off a nuclear weapon because he's not winning um, in Ukraine. And if he did that, that would set a model for those other um, conflicts where nuclear powers are facing off against each other. So, you know, putting history aside or ignorance of history aside, you know, in the case of President Trump, it's not going to be able to be solved within 24 hours. The knock-on effects from this war are very important. It's not just China and other countries that are watching this very closely. Uh, it's changing the whole patterns of global interaction. Who would have thought that we'd be watching Kim Jong-un and Putin meeting with Putin getting military support from North Korea and not the other way around? I mean, this is putting history in many respects on its head. Right. That's right. So on the knock-on effects, Timothy. Um, so, so, so first of all, since Fiona several times mentioned 1783, something else happened in 1783, which is Catherine the Great annexed Crimea. And it, it, I think it's really important to say Russia has zero, zero right to Crimea. Crimea was Russian for a much shorter period of time than Silesia was German. Silesia was German continuously from the 1740s until 1945. Crimea only belonged to Russia, strictly speaking, from 1783 until 1917, after the Russian Civil War, it became part of the Soviet Union, but for a lot of that time as an autonomous Soviet socialist republic. And, of course, its original people are the Crimean Tatars, not Russians. Um, and then Khrushchev gave it back in 1954. So if we even acknowledge even a scintilla of legitimacy to the claim that because that belonged to us once, sometime back then in history, there's a legitimacy to our claim to it now, 
international order is lost. Germany would then have a stronger claim to Silesia than <laughs> Russia has to Crimea, and um, you know, we might like to take the American colonies back, or maybe Calais from the French, you know. <laughs> I mean, so I, I just, that's, an, that's the importance of putting these historical claims back in the cupboard where they belong. Um, comment on the knock-on effects. So the post-war period is arguably the greatest triumph of the West. But interestingly, it ushers in a transition to what one might call loosely a post-Western world, right? So one of the revelations, the shocks for us in the West has been, here's Russia waging a brutal war of recolonization, and India, Brazil, Turkey, South Africa, Indonesia, you know, China, think that's not so bad. And we're perfectly happy to go on doing business with them. I mean, look at the picture of the BRICS summit with Lavrov grinning all over his cynical face as he clutches hands with President Xi, President Lulu, President Ramaphosa, and Prime Minister Modi. So there's a real lesson and challenge to us there. We are in, in this sense, a post-Western world, that is to say, one in which, not, not one in which the West ceases to exist or ceases to be rich and powerful, but one in which the West can no longer set the agenda of world politics in the way we have done until now. Last quick comment on US-Europe, burden sharing. We talked about burden sharing security. In my view, there's another burden sharing. I think Europe should do the lion's share of reconstruction for Ukraine. I don't think we should be asking for a new, you mentioned Marshall Plan, you know, 80 years nearly after the end of the Second World War. Why should the United States be doing the, you know, the, the heavy lifting economically? And this requires the country which Constanza Stelzenmuller writes about so brilliantly, Germany, actually to step up to the plate. This is the thing. Ger Germany has shifted a lot on the military position, but Germany, you cannot expect Germany to lead on the military support for Ukraine. But economic, to do its bit, but not to lead. But you can expect it to lead on the economic reconstruction effort, which is built into bringing Ukraine step by step into the EU. So that's the other burden sharing. Yeah, and this is such an important point. By the way, I do want to get, we're not going to have very much time, but I probably will get to one or two quick questions. But first, a final question to both of you from me, which is very much on this question of the post-war. And you talked about reconstruction uh, being just one aspect of it. There's also the geopolitical aspect of having Russia as uh, a revisionist power, either a defeated revisionist power or... Uh, in a different scenario, uh, one that continues to fight on or one that is victorious. Fiona, this image this week really made me think a lot about that, actually, uh, the image of Putin meeting with Kim Jong-un, because one scenario, but only one that we can envision, certainly is a Russia that is increasingly isolated in the world, a sort of a Russian North Korea scenario in which it's uh, even more militarized than it is, perhaps its borders are more formally closed even than they are now. Uh, perhaps it pursues an even more explicit kind of techno uh, totalitarianism that we've seen evolve in both uh, North Korea and China. So what, what are the scenarios that you are considering right now, both of you, for kind of Russia in the post-war? Because we can't imagine a stable European order until we can understand uh, what role Russia in the future would play in it. Well, I think getting back to where we started, 1989, and I'm thinking about Edward Shevardnadze again sitting you know, on that uh, podium um, getting his honorary degree, is that we're going to you know, um, have a lot of road ahead of us and there's going to be a lot of chaos. And I think that you know, coming up with some sort of definitive vision right now is impossible. Because you know, we, um, what I would imagine in you know, kind of a Russian case is um, you know, not just more of a, sort of an attempt at um, consolidation of power around Putin and you know, somebody after Putin trying to emulate the same thing, but a lot of fraying inside of Russia, like the kind of things we saw in the, 90, in the 1990s. 
Um, I, I'm not, you know, I, I wouldn't be one to actually predict the collapse of Russia, and I know that a lot of people are kind of looking at that, and then some in Ukraine are kind of hoping that that will be kind of one of the outcomes. But if you actually look, and we have to factor in uh, Russian opposition, Russian exiles now, just like we had to in 1917. You know, Lenin came back after, you know, a couple of decades of being in Europe. There are so many Russians in Europe now, not just uh, Ukrainians. They're all sitting around not planning the dissolution of the Russian Federation, but how they can play a role in Russia's future, but with a different kind of Russia, more decentralized, more of a parliamentarian um, system. They're not, unfortunately, you know, many of them really unpacking, you know, the kind of the problems of Russian history, and countries rarely do that. The UK hasn't done it. The United States hasn't done it. The Germans did it under duress and did it well, but East Germany didn't because East Germany was in a different place, and there's still that kind of legacy to unpack in Germany. So, um, I, you know, I think when we, when we look at Russia, there's going to be a heck of a lot of work to do. It won't be like 1989 all over again. We won't be able to do uh, and engage in, uh, you know, many of the things that we did before. It's a more mature country. It's going to have deeper relationships with China than it certainly did before, with the Middle East. Um, you know, so many Russians are now heading through Dubai. They've uh, shifted their trade and commerce uh, to uh, the Middle East. Uh, you know, we're going to be seeing a lot of distortions there. We're going to see, um, you know, Russian public uh, that remains angry. Because although they, um, Mr. Prigozhin summed it all up, the war was a mistake, but we don't want to lose it. Uh, and that's going to be, um, you know, something that we're going to have to contend with. Russia will still be wanting to find its place somewhere, as it always has through its larger sweep of history. And it's going to take a lot of ingenuity and, you know, kind of hard-headed uh, thinking. But we shouldn't do that at the expense of Ukraine. That's you know, Russia is a problem unto itself. It's manifesting itself in a pretty you know, horrific way, but that should not you know, stop us from thinking about Ukraine and Ukraine's future in a different way. Post-war. Yeah, first of all, um, we've got to get to post-war. So the most important and urgent thing we have to do is to enable Ukraine to win this war. And that would have been easier if we'd given more military support sooner last year. We were in crisis management road rather than in war-winning mode. You know, the French have a saying, à la guerre comme à la guerre. When it's war, it's war. You've got to win it. And now it's going to be a long, hard slog, and I'm really worried that we're not going to have the level of sustained support. I mean, obviously, particularly if Trump wins, but even if not. Um, and that a clear Ukrainian victory, which means a Russian defeat, clearly, is, in my view, the best thing for Russia, too. Richard von Weizsäcker made a great speech in 1985, famous speech in the Bundestag, where he said to his compatriots, to the Germans, hey guys, you know what? Defeat was the best thing that happened to us. Our freedom, our prosperity, our democracy, the rule of law was all built on the foundations of defeat. And in a way, the Russian tragedy is that you can't have a defeat like that. But what we do want to see, I think, is what I call the maximum feasible defeat, so Putin can't go home and say, well, basically, I got much of Nova Russia, and I'm, you know, well, it's a sort of victory. So to sum up and answer your question, uh, Ivan Krastev the other day said, we used to have a Russia policy but no Ukraine policy. Now we have a Ukraine policy but no Russia policy. I think that is wrong because our Ukraine policy is our Russia policy, Right. I mean, Putin thinks Ukraine is part of Russia. So if we demonstrate that it's not, that it's an independent European country, that changes the future of Russia. All right. I think if our organizers will indulge us, we can take two quick questions. One, one, question. one question. Okay. All right. You get it. They're next to each other. You, you, both of you two can give us a very quick question. Okay. Quick uh, disclosure, Carl Golovin, my father was born in Odessa when it was Russia, 1912. His father was captain of the port for the Tsar. So I have a, perhaps a bias. But uh, Zelensky has famously said that uh, Ukraine will be like a, big, a greater Israel. Uh, there's a book that I think is very important that has never been translated to English by reputable author Alexander Solzhenitsyn, 200 Years Together, A History of the Jews in Russia. Have any of you read that in Russian, French, or German, the only languages in which it's been published? Or can you encourage uh, even Putin to have Russia release their official English translation because Western publishers won't, won't release it to us? Hi, uh, Pascal Sigol at Insight Through Analysis. My question is, so in this, um, you know, trying to construct this new order with uh, Ukraine, um, 
what role does U.S. security guarantees play? All right. Quickly, quick response to that, Fiona. Well, I think um, on the question of the security guarantees, as you've probably also already surmised from things that we're uh, saying here, it's not sufficient for just the United States to have security guarantees. It has to be European countries and many others as well. So the United States will play a very important role in terms of leadership and commitment and not going wobbly, as we've all been you know, talking about, and on the diplomatic front um, as well. But it's not sufficient to just have this about the United States. In fact, that's what Putin wants. He wants to make this look like a conflict with the United States. He would like Yalta. You know, basically, he doesn't just want Yalta, uh, the, the city, but Yalta, the World War II uh, conference in which just a group of um, guys, a very small number of guys, decide who gets to have what. So a larger framing for this is very important. I think we've um, already laid that out. It's very interesting that you point out. I had no idea that that had not been uh, fully translated. I have to confess, not having not read the book, but knowing of uh, the book. And I think, you know, what we're seeing here, and this is what Zelensky is trying to get across, and also with the appointment of um, Rustam Umerov as the new defence minister, that Ukraine is a complex place with a complex history. Cities like Mariupol um, had very large Greek contingents. And in fact, in the absolute devastation of Mariupol, many Greek citizens, contemporary Greek citizens, died. The whole of the Black Sea region and all of Ukraine is a kind of a melting pot from uh, previous civilizations. It was obviously the cradle of Jewish life uh, in uh, the old Russian Empire. The Pale of Settlement extended across this. And I think it's important for all of us you know, to really understand that complexity. And that's what Zelensky is trying to get over. And it also runs in the face of you know, Putin's point that if you speak Russian and you are Russian uh, ethnically, then you are Russian. Uh, and I think that everything, you know, that um, Zelensky and Ukraine are trying to stand for is also that you can be many things and have uh, an overarching Ukrainian identity. Timothy, a final word from you. Um, I, I will go totally agree with Fiona and go even further. I mean, clearly it has to be a number of NATO member states giving the security guarantees. You'll get them, by the way. Britain, Poland, Estonia, there's a bunch of countries, and I hope Germany and France, okay? But, but that in itself is not enough. That has to be a stepping stone to NATO membership. The only lasting guarantee of, and, and, and the precondition for effective reconstruction is NATO membership. I hope that at the Warsaw Summit of, uh, uh, at the Washington, Warsaw, Washington Summit of NATO next July, uh, Ukraine actually gets what it didn't get in Vilnius, an invitation to membership of NATO, not instant membership, but an invitation to membership of NATO. And then, of course, there are some very tough questions about how you implement that. The more of its sovereign territory Ukraine itself controls, the easier it becomes. But that's the way we have to go. And last word, if we succeed in doing that and the reconstruction and reform effort and the integration into the EU as well as NATO, then I can actually write a very optimistic sequel to this book because this would then be a really remarkable further step forward towards the great goal of a Europe whole and free. So a really quite unexpected uh, ending to this you know, really dark period in European history. And a shockingly optimistic uh, finish for this conversation, I have to say. I didn't expect us to be going there. So to sum up, uh, next year in Washington is uh, the thing. And Fiona and uh, Timothy, I want to thank you. And I hope Brookings will reconvene us so that we can uh, 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 all celebrate uh, this, this rosy scenario that at least the glimmers of suggested itself. Please do stick around. There's a lot of more terrific panels uh, to come. But in the meantime, please join me in thanking Fiona and Timothy and buy the book.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second panel at the fall opener for uh, Brookings Foreign Policy CUSE event. My name is Asla Aydin Tashbash. I am a fellow at the Center on United States and Europe at uh, Brookings Institution. And uh, we have um, a terrific panel, which is going to be, which is going to be actually a continuation of some of the issues. We have heard Fiona and Tim Timothy Gardenash discuss on the first panel. Um, I have an all-star cast here. Let me quickly introduce them. Jim Townsend here. Uh, he has, you know him as the co-host of a cooking show, Brussels Sprouts. <laughs> Uh, a co-host of a foreign policy show, of course, uh, and uh, he served as uh, a deputy undersecretary of defense, working on NATO issues in and out of government under Obama administration and previous uh, subsequent administrations. Tara Varma, our very own Tara Varma, has joined Brookings from Europe. She is an expert on European security, French foreign policy, and uh, Indo-Pacific issues, Tara, good to see you here. Stephen Wertheim is from next door, uh, from, the Car from Carnegie. Uh, he is a fellow on the American Statecraft Program at Carnegie, and his recent book, 2020, entitled Tomorrow, the World, the Birth of U.S. Global Supremacy, takes a very critical view on U.S. Uh, military uh, and uh, defense policy, uh, uh, particularly uh, of the past few decades, and looking forward to discussing that in the Ukraine context. And finally, Mariana Bujerin uh, has recently joined us as a non-resident fellow, but she herself is at Harvard Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Kennedy School and uh, working as a senior research associate with a very impressive, uh, very impressive uh, project called Managing the Atom. So we'll be talking about some of the issues. Now, a couple of days ago, this week, earlier this week, we had uh, Secretary Blinken right around the corner, uh, actually at the at SAIS, School of Advanced and International Studies, across the hall, and um, he said a number of very interesting things. He said that we are going through what is essentially um, a hinge moment in history today, that post-war period has ended and the new one has not started, and has talked about uh, basically, um, you know, has quoted Nietzsche saying, we don't know, where, we, we know where we want to go, but we don't know how to get there without stumbling into, uh, 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 into something. So really laying out some of the uh, dilemmas that we heard on the first panel about Russia, about Europe, about defense, and the way forward. Um, Jim, I want to start with you. Our panel is entitled Europe's Path Between Russia, China, and America. Now, Secretary Blinken has called this a hinge moment, unhinged, the, the, the moment when world order becomes unhinged. Um, President Biden has called it an inflection point. Does, what does it mean for Europe and transatlantic uh, alliance? In particular, does Europe need a path between Russia, China, and America? Well, thank you. Uh, let me... Can you hear me? Ah, there we go. Uh, well, thank you for the question, and thank you for putting me first. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is an interesting uh, question about what kind of path Europe needs to take, uh, and also this idea of being an unhinged moment and also an inflection point, and we've heard these terms over and over again, which uh, I, it seems to me, having worked in this field for 30-some-odd years, we're always at an inflection point. It seems like every five years, NATO's in crisis or we're at a crossroads or something. And, uh, and so, uh, yes, we're definitely in a, in a, in a place of change, uh, but we've been in places of change before, too. And I think that what has helped us deal with change and deal with the unknown is that a lot of the structures that we built after World War II are still in place. Not that they don't need to be tweaked and changed and, and brought up to date, as, and we continually do that at NATO. It's always reforming itself. 
Uh, but this is something that we can hold on to that we didn't have before World War II when there were crises in those times uh, that ended up being dealt with through war. We've got some, we have these these institutions, these structures that give us an idea of what how we can navigate. And that's for Europe, I think, uh, one of the great tools that it has since the end of World War II is the European Union and the structure that it has and the ability that it has shown, certainly since COVID, to actually work together as a union of nations to try to help their membership through tough times. And so we have these so we structures to, to help us out. And I think one of the things that we're going to to have to really focus on is something Timothy said, and that is we've got this war going on in Ukraine that is going to have a tremendous impact on what this pathway is going to look like. Uh, and I, we've got to stay focused on that. Uh, for the United States, I think uh, particularly we've got a problem with wobbliness uh, right now, and it's getting worse, something that Europe is concerned about. So for Europe and its path, it's going to depend on what the United States does in terms of Ukraine. It depends on what's going to happen on the battlefield in Ukraine. And I think we'll have a better idea of what the pathway is going to look like for Europe as it navigates uh, what happens once peace finally comes to Ukraine. Uh, you've raised a number of very interesting issues. I go back to Blink, uh, Secretary Blinken, who said what we're experiencing now is more than a test of the post-Cold War order. It's the end of it. Now, I want to skip Tara because I want her to respond as a European. Uh, but, Stephen, um, Europe's path between the great powers and whether or not we can hold on to Cold War systems and institutions, what we loosely call as a rules-based order, uh, if there's a victory for Ukraine at the end of all of this? First of all, well done to everybody who's come out in a post-pandemic uh, September uh, Friday morning. It's great to see people uh, fill the room uh, in this, in this uh, setting. So um, I think that uh, it's good to get beyond the massive abstraction of the rules-based order or the liberal international order, which nobody, including me, seems quite able to, to define, right? Um, I think right now uh, there's um, a choice to be made with respect to the way the transatlantic uh, alliance uh, understands itself and where it's going for the next several decades. And, you know, essentially the, the choice is, is like this. Um, the United States could continue to take the lead uh, in a much more competitive uh, global environment uh, in counterbalancing China in the Indo-Pacific, as well as Russia, a more aggressive and unpredictable Russia in Europe. Um, Europe's side of that bargain will be to probably have to come over to Washington's uh, side more in terms of the threat perception of China, uh, de-risking uh, economically from, from China, uh, and it would probably remain uh, dependent on the United States for its own security. And right now, I think that is the prevailing approach uh, from the Biden administration in Washington and uh, transatlantically. Uh, I think that that is not going to put uh, the alliance on a good footing to secure its goals in 5, 10, 20 years, uh, because I think it is past time for Europe not to be dependent on either the capabilities or the willpower of the United States uh, to come to Europe's rescue in a, in a moment of crisis. The fact that we're sitting here and talking about contemplating Donald Trump returning to the White House in a little bit more than a year uh, should be very telling in that regard, but I think it would also be a mistake to get fixated on the figure of Trump himself. Uh, there are some deeper reasons why I think uh, the United States uh, is ill-equipped to manage the Russia problem in addition to the China problem, in addition to all the headwinds that it faces in its own society going forward. And one of the reasons why I think Secretary Blinken is right to call this uh, at least a potential inflection point or the end of an era uh, is that the United States recommitted to European security after the Cold War uh, really because of the lack of threat, because things seemed so good, it seemed like the United States could remain 
the leading guarantor of European security, and even expand its commitments under, uh, under with an expanding NATO, uh, precisely because the cost seemed low. I mean, read the entire congressional debate on the uh, expansion in 2004 uh, to, to seven countries, including the, the Baltic countries. No, nobody was, was taking seriously the question, will the United States actually have to come to the defense of NATO territory uh, in these places that uh, many of which bordered Russia. So we face a very different environment, and I think it'd be a mistake to look at uh, you know, decades of seemingly fairly consistent U.S. commitment to European security uh, and assume that that is the most uh, you know, uh, low-risk way for, uh, for the transatlantic community to achieve its goals because the underlying conditions uh, that elicited the U.S. commitment uh, have have changed so profoundly. Uh, so I would favor more of a division of labor approach in which uh, Europe, uh, I think no better moment than now, uses the opportunity now uh, to uh, take over the lion's share of the defense burden gradually over time, but, but starting now. Uh, and that would free the United States up uh, to handle uh, both security in Asia and uh, pressing uh, domestic needs. So, Tara, I want to come to you now. Um, as a European listening to this, is this on? No. As a European listening to this debate, still not on. Maybe the battery's out. I can borrow your mic for a quick question. Um, so, as a European listening to this debate between uh, two uh, U.S. Uh, thought leaders. What, it, what do you hear and what is the lesson for Europe as it charts out a course uh, between uh, uh, United States, China, and Russia? Uh, that clearly is, I think, the overlapping, one overlapping aspect of what both Jim and Stephen said has was being come close to America. But what is the, how does it sound in Europe? Thanks so much, Asla. Um, it is great to be here. I'm really struck by both Jim and Stephen's interventions, and I was listening to Stephen just now thinking um, that I think I agree with him. Uh, Europe needs to do more, but for the past 30 years, if not more, the idea for Europe that the, was that the U.S. was going to guarantee its security and was going to do so through NATO in particular. So now if we're looking at a situation where the NATO commitment might not be so strong and the U.S. might refocus... We have a Europe that has not invested enough in its defense. And I don't think it needs to be an either or. I don't think it's NATO or Europe. I think this debate, honestly, is 30 years old. The situation that Europe is in now is totally different. But we need to have the discussion. If NATO is not going to be the main guarantor of European security, we find ourselves extremely vulnerable. I mean, in military terms. In economic terms, I think we've understood our, vulnerab our vulnerability clearly. Um, the post... Well, how we faced COVID and the realization that we were so dependent on Chinese and Indian markets in particular for key pharmaceuticals, I think was really a, a sea change moment for the EU. And I honestly don't think the EU could have acted the way it acted since the beginning of Russia's invasion of Ukraine if it hadn't gone through the COVID pandemic. The fact that the COVID pandemic led to debt mutualization, to really overcoming a number of taboos in Euro uh, European policymaking, was, was a true moment. Um, I mean, the commission president says that she wants to lead a geopolitical commission. Uh, we've heard countries like France and Germany talking about European sovereignty, but these were more about a vision of how Europe is to act in the world and is to act as an economic powerhouse. Talking about European defense, European capabilities in terms of defense is still something that is not so easy to do. It's not so easy to do here because I think Washington is also very contradictory there. We do hear voices, more and more voices coming from both sides of the aisle saying Europe needs to do more, but at the same time it should also stay in NATO. And so how is it supposed to do more if, it's, if we can't think of European security beyond NATO and if the U.S. is not going to commit to staying longer? I think we really find ourselves in a very contradictory situation. And I'm just talking about the European security order here. I'm not even talking about how Russia features in all this and how Russia's war in Ukraine features in the European security order and how China features in European decision-making. China is 
is still a major trading partner for the EU. It will remain so. There are a number of countries in the European Union who do not want to see a change right now. We are talking about de-risking, absolutely, and we're preparing for it. But de-risking is a tactic. It's not a strategy. De-risking is not a long-term plan. It's a preparation. What is the EU's long-term plan in dealing with Russia, China, and the US? And I'm not putting the three on par. I think we have very different relationships uh, with these three countries. But the way Europe can, and the EU in particular can position itself as a geopolitical actor, as having an ambition on the world stage, is something that's going to take time. This is, this is a new vision for the EU. It is almost antithetic to the European project. The European political project was a peace project. It was a very idea that we didn't need geopolitics anymore, that we were going to overcome geopolitics. We're facing a moment right now where we're realizing that this is not possible and that we need to become a geopolitical actor and that we will need to reconcile the tension of being a peace project and being a geopolitical actor at the same time. Tara, thank you. You've given us a sense of the internal European debate as well. Let's uh, put it out there. There isn't a consensus on some of these issues inside Europe or among transatlantic partners. And when it comes to the topic of Asia, uh, pivot to Asia or, 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 uh, or meeting the challenge from China, I think we've heard uh, Timothy Garton Ash uh, represent one particular perspective early in the early panel Essentially, uh, you know, if Europeans saying if you want to pivot to Asia, help us win in Ukraine. And Stephen here has put it the other way around. Do more in Ukraine so we can pivot to Asia. Uh, obviously, both of these uh, views, opinions, are out here in this town. Now, but I want to bring this uh, to Europe European security and NATO issues. Mariana, there's a war raging in uh, Ukraine. You're following the debate in Ukraine as well as uh, looking into European security aspect of it. What does, how do you formulate what this war means for us for the future of European security? Um, is a Ukrainian victory essential for future European security architecture? If so, how would you define that architecture? Thank you so much, Ashley. And um, let me just take a moment before I attempt to. <laughs> I mean, I got, the, I got it all figured out, I can tell you right off. But before I answer the, your question, um, I, you know, some of you might know I'm Ukrainian. Uh, my family is still in Ukraine. Uh, many of the people that are close to me are still in Ukraine. And I just want, I, I can't speak on behalf of the entire country, but I want to take this moment to thank all of you who, through your efforts, through your thoughts, uh, through your contributions, through your taxpayer dollars, have been supporting Ukraine in this hour of need. Uh, it is not an overstatement to say that my country stands today because in large part because of the support uh, and solidarity it has received um, from this country as well as as kind of the Western civilized uh, world, as we like to call it. Um, I think, uh, you know, based on the discussion that we have uh, been having today, I'd, I'd like to... to rewind back a little bit to to understand the nature of the whole European project, uh, right, and the whole European... Um, you know, business of integration. Um, you know, Timothy Garden Nash is here, and, and he introduced us uh, to this topic a little bit in the first panel. But really, um, this was the answer to to the devastation to a war torn continent that seemed to not be able to kind of put its business in order for the first half of the 20th century, uh, becoming the, the, the locus of two world wars, right? And what we learned in the interwar period is that having a lot of small, quote-unquote, sovereign nations that have either weak, unprotected statehood, you know, with all the, the possible disputes about borders and languages and matching borders with languages and with ethnicities, uh, with rising revanchist powers in the mix on one continent is a recipe for disaster. And that's what 
you know, ultimately resulted in the bloodiest, most destructive military conflict the history has ever known. So much of the thinking in the first post-war years was, how do we prevent that from happening in the future? And my, many of the debates were, were about containing Germany, right? A lot of these projects, um, you know, including uh, the, the U.S. sort of underwriting the, the, uh, the security of the continent was to prevent the resurgence of, of Germany. That might seem absurd to us today, but that was very real thinking uh, at the time. And um, basically, this was a new experiment. There was an experiment in integrating these really very different countries that have a lot of, you know, historical animosities between each other uh, for, for centuries before. And the, the prosperity and the success of the European project, no matter what we think about how, you know, the bureaucracies in Brussels and all of that, I'm sure we all have our horror stories, ultimately... It was an incredibly successful project in Europe after a devastating war. And the U.S. role in that, not just financial through Marshall Plan, but through being kind of this outside power, right, to whom various actors could defer instead of uh, kind of battling it out uh, between themselves, was a very stabilizing factor. Ultimately, there was much political purchase, much political weight to the NATO alliance as much as a defense uh, uh, component of it. And that is why the alliance did not disintegrate um, after, after 89, after the end of the Cold War. It hung together, perhaps without you know, as much a purpose or uh, what else. But it still it persevered, it kept on, and it expanded in very stark contrast to what had happened in the East with the Warsaw Pact. The moment the course of power of the patron was removed, the thing fizzled away, right? So there is an inherent value, uh, right? There's something that keeps um, this European project together, and the, the U.S. security guarantee is a very crucial to it, and to bring it to Ukraine um, in, in just a couple of sentences, what the post-Soviet settlement left was basically a huge Ukraine-sized security vacuum in the middle of Europe. Again, um, over Ukraine, over Moldova, over Georgia, over the, this other sort of Soviet periphery, as it were, the former periphery of, uh, of a former empire, um, that basically recreated that interwar situation of small countries with sort of developing weak uh, sovereignty, right, still going through some of these th in the throes of post-Soviet transition, battling a lot of its own, you know, problems, institution building, uh, trying to provide for their security with a resurgent and re revanchist uh, former imperial power. It is no surprise at all that the next big war in Europe should break out in exactly that, that security vacuum. Uh, so, you know, with, with Ukraine eyeing NATO, it's not just a wish list that Ukrainian um, leaders have. Let's remember that there was no appetite for NATO in Ukraine the first at least 10 years of Ukrainian statehood. And it was only a function of revanchist Russia uh, coming back on, on, on stage that prompted Ukrainian leaders to consider that as the only other alternative to its security. So um, Ukraine and NATO, let's go to, let's stay on this question for a little bit, Jim. Um, is it uh, the original sin or a solution to, the, uh, a, to our problem, uh, possibly ending the war? By way of original sin, I'm referring to uh, 2008, Bucharest, uh, the much-talked-about NATO decision to keep Ukraine and Georgia in the waiting room, um, uh, signaling that they will be, uh, they might be, perhaps one day, uh, members, but for, not right now. And there are two arguments out there. One, that that was a mistake that provoked Russia. And the second argument, obviously, is that 
that tempted Russia but didn't deliver enough guarantees, and therefore it was a half measure that uh, backfired. Uh, one, if you could give me your sense of the NATO enlargement debate. I know you worked on these issues in, inside, in and out of government, but also looking forward, is NATO part of the solution here when it comes to Ukraine and European security? Well, thank you. Um, this, uh, that question, I, we could stay here for a couple of hours. I would love to talk about this. I was involved with NATO enlargement from the first day. Uh, as a young man in the Pentagon, um, working in the Europe office there in the charge of Partnership for Peace and, and all of getting uh, NATO uh, nation candidates ready to, to get into the alliance. And, uh, and that I've worked it ever since, one way or another. So uh, original sin, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting way to put it. I, uh, I, I think when I look back on 2008, um, it, was, it was a mistake that was made uh, and shaped by the politics and the personalities who were there in Bucharest in 2008, doing it themselves at the negotiating table while NATO was in the process of trying to have a, have a summit meeting. And it was, it was a mistake that uh, uh, others said uh, at the time that this was going to, this was not the way to approach Ukraine membership but by having uh, um, having them turned away and, and Bucharest uh, without something there in terms, something stronger than what, it was putting them in a very Membership awkward, action. bad position, absolutely, without the map, you know, without other things as well. I think that was a, not a, it was a, the understanding around the table, certainly on the U.S. delegation there, was not deep enough to understand the ramifications of what they were doing. Uh, there were other, other uh, pressures and politics going on around that table that had them go in a direction that was, um, a very uh, half step, as you said, and I think we've had to pay for that uh, with the invasion of Georgia and now Ukraine, and we, we, we see what's happened. But I do believe in 2008 it was a failure of statecraft by the United States and some of the allies that led to a bad draft uh, communique and, and led to where we are. In terms of today and looking to the future, what we don't want, to my mind, uh, is another Vilnius uh, that happened a couple of months ago in a communique and an approach that was almost in some ways worse than 2008. Um, I, uh, I, I think we now are looking at a future that's got to include NATO uh, and EU membership. T Timothy laid this out. Fiona laid this out very well, I think, in the, in the panel before. I don't, I don't have to repeat them. But it is part of the solution. It's, it's a matter of now how do we do it. And I will say at the Washington summit, the pressure on the administration not to have a Vilnius, but to bring in uh, Ukraine at this crowning summit, uh, anniversary summit, election uh, summer summit, uh, a lot of political pressure there. The, the, you know, the idea of Ukraine's future in NATO will be acute this summer. It will be what everyone is going to be looking for. And as far as I'm concerned, we've got to do it then. We cannot afford to have a, another, uh, you know, kicking, kicking it down the road or another misfire like 2008. So that is part of the solution. EU membership has got to be part of that too. It cannot lag behind just the way we did it in the 90s and in the 2000s. And Jim, you're saying that regardless of what ha what's happening on the battlefield... I say that absolutely. And there was a time not so far ago when I would say, well, you know, we're going to have to see where we are on the battlefield. But I think we've passed that point. Also, I'm a bit more optimistic on where things are going on the, on the battlefield, and I think we'll, have, we'll be in a place where we can do that. But I don't think we can wait. We've got to do it. We've got to do it this summer. Uh, Steve, I'm going to get to you in a minute because I know you have views on this enlargement issue that, that are uh, divergent from uh, Jim's, but... Tara, uh, the French position on NATO and Ukraine has been interesting. It's really evolved almost 180 degree difference uh, from being very opposed to now being a champion of uh, uh, Ukraine membership issue. We've seen that at Vilnius with President Macron. Is this a real shift? Is this a public relations exercise? Is this, does this reflect uh, the divisions inside Europe? Tell us uh, how you read it. They say it's a real shift. Um, I would say to me, actually, the, the more important shift is the one on EU enlargement, which the France was blocking. Uh, to me, that is more of a strategic shift from the French side. The French... Uh, 
have been known to block EU enlargement for a very long time. There's this debate in Europe about whether you deep you deepen the union, uh, whether you enlarge it. A number of people were saying you can do both simultaneously. There was a division inside Europe of people who are thinking we need to enlarge because the strength of the EU is actually its openness, its capacity to absorb. And the French were very much more of the idea that um, we needed to go uh, towards an ever closer union, something the Brits really didn't like uh, and, and was very much part of the Brexit debate when the, the Brits decided to leave. They didn't want this idea of an ever closer union. So the French were pushing for that. And to me, the idea that now France has endorsed... Um, of course, Ukraine coming into EU, but also Moldova, whom we don't uh, speak of so much here, but was, it was actually an integral part of the strategic debate uh, because there are Russian troops in Moldova right now and there are threats to Moldovan security on a quasi-daily basis uh, by Russian forces. I think that's important to say. The fact that the French have moved on this is really interesting to me. Uh, I think... For Macron, it was very opportunistic. He really sees this as a moment where he can champion his idea of European sovereignty even more. Uh, the fact that we're, go we're going to go towards this uh, greater European Union with Ukraine and Moldova, but also the Western Balkans, who would be integrated. So looking at a union of 35 member states uh, with complicated neighbors, uh, but also complexities in terms of how you get uh, all these countries into the single market, how you make sure there is a level playing field, how do you make sure the EU is competitive, because again, the EU is an economic powerhouse, and this is its trend today. Uh, I think to me that is the more interesting shift, and I, in a way, Macron gave a speech in Bratislava uh, earlier this year where he atoned for French mistakes um, in terms of French attitudes toward Eastern, Central and Eastern European uh, member states, which I found actually quite interesting. To me, honestly, that is, on the French side, the much greater shift than, than on the NATO enlargement side where the French are very much in favor of Ukraine coming in, but they keep saying also as long as the U.S. is blocking, nothing is going to happen. That's the reality of NATO negotiations. And as long as the, as the U.S. is not endorsing it publicly, then in a way it's fairly easy for Paris to say that it wants Ukraine in because it knows that things won't move. It's a bit of a safe position. I, I want you to sum up uh, European sovereignty, which is a big buzzword in Europe but rarely heard in this town. It's a big concept for geopolitical Europe? In one sentence, what is it? It's about building critical infrastructure, uh, protecting Europe all the while remaining open, protecting the rules-based international order, and the transatlantic alliance plays a huge role in European sovereignty. So there's also the sense that Europe needs to grow stronger in terms of protecting critical materials, protecting its economic strength, but it also wants partners. This is not an autarkic EU. This is not an inward-looking EU. It's really about an EU building partnerships, transatlantic very much, uh, alliance very much central to it, but also building partnerships with the Middle East, with Asia. I'm thinking of the, the, this new corridor which was announced at the G20 meeting, the IMEC, India, Middle East, Europe corridor, which is going to play also a central role in terms of the EU presenting itself as an infrastructure provider uh, and partnering in a very different way uh, with Asian and Middle Eastern countries, not looking just at Europe providing um, infrastructure and know-how, but actually building true partnerships. Stephen, um, when he was the ambas U.S. ambassador to Moscow, uh, Bill Burns is said to have called uh, NATO membership, uh, Ukraine's na membership to NATO, the reddest of all red lines for Russia, uh, which is something that is uh, in your recent New York Times article, which appeared right before Vilnius. You, think you have a publicly divergent position from Jim. You think enlargement is, uh, was a mistake and will be a mistake for Ukraine. Now, um, but now we're in this war. Everyone is part of this war. Uh, the, war uh, the term proxy war has been... Uh, thrown, about, uh, thrown about in the first session. Is it, it's almost unavoidable uh, to mention uh, NATO in this context. Uh, have your views changed and can NATO afford to lose in this instance? Well, it's very important that Ukraine uh, you know, continue to exist as, a, as an independent country. 
uh, that, of course, we hope that the war will end. On what terms and, and when remain a huge question. Um, but we face a really difficult question about what is the best way uh, for Ukraine to be secure, independent, prosperous, hopefully democratic, and non-corrupt in the future. And this is where a little bit of recent history, I think, is, um, is illuminating. So I'm going to drift a little bit back, and then I'll come to the present question. It strikes me that a lot of the supporters today of Ukraine joining NATO or being offered an invitation to join in the near term sound a lot like the critics of NATO enlargement when the post-Cold War process of enlargement began in the late 1990s. The critics, among whom included George Kennan, um, argued that although there wouldn't be any near-term uh, catastrophe with Russia, that launching enlargement as an open-ended process, not a one-time thing, not a, okay, we'll do it, um, maybe that's the end, but as an explicitly continuous process in which new countries moving closer to Russia's uh, borders uh, would be constantly considered and the door left open. This was something that would create a new dividing line in post-Cold War Europe, where it was still possible that uh, a dividing line uh, might not exist, or still seem possible. Uh, and the United States and other members of NATO, but the United States in particular, would therefore uh, gain uh, new security commitments that would be harder and harder to defend more and more peripheral from the core U.S. interest in ensuring a basically peaceful and stable Europe, particularly Western, Northern, and, and Central Europe, uh, and be more prone to antagonize Russia and turn Russia hostile. And I would add to that argument that who would be left especially vulnerable? Well, it would be those states caught in the middle of an expanding NATO military alliance and a potentially more aggrieved Russia, and not actually given protection by NATO. So to date, I don't think that the process of NATO enlargement has been something that has benefited Ukraine, even as I understand perfectly well that it makes sense for Ukraine to want to get into NATO. So you mentioned 2008. Um, you know, I think we're all dissatisfied with 2008 for good reason, uh, but in what direction are we dissatisfied? Uh, was the problem that Ukraine wasn't given membership? Uh, or was the problem that the whole question was very publicly broached, an empty promise was made, this was provocative to Russia without providing security to Ukraine, and we should have not gone down that road to begin with. So I'm in that latter camp, and unfortunately, look, there's an unfortunate dichotomy right now in the public debate between the causes of the war, were the causes of the war something internal to Russia, Russian imperialism, Russian aggression, or was NATO enlargement a factor? They were both factors. They, they are more mutually reinforcing factors than they are competing factors. It's in part precisely because Russia sought uh, a sphere of influence uh, in post-Soviet territory uh, particularly areas with Russian speakers, uh, that NATO enlargement to those areas uh, was so galling uh, to so many Russians, as, as Bill Burns wrote in, in, in 2008. So these are both in play. Therefore, I'd be very concerned about extending NATO membership uh, to Ukraine, particularly because, you know, for nine years now that the war between Russia and Ukraine has occurred, every NATO member has chosen not to directly fight for Ukraine. Uh, making a pledge to do so uh, would uh, potentially lack credibility. I think it would force us in response to station large numbers of troops, perhaps nuclear weapons, uh, in Ukraine. If you think about what was done in West Germany, and that was West Germany in the, in the Cold War to make deterrence try to seem credible in that case, so we have a real problem in this case. I think an EU path for Ukraine, though, uh, is, is very promising. And as Fiona Hill said earlier, we should not give Vladimir Putin what he wants, which is an opportunity to make uh, 
uh, what happens in Ukraine, uh, a, a showdown between the United States and, and, and uh, Russia. Marianne, I'm going to get to you in a second, but quickly to Jim, a quick answer. Uh, so C was saying membership means a NATO-Ukraine, as a NATO-Russia war, essentially us having to defend Ukraine, Article 5, possible nuclear weapons, possible NATO troops. How do you prevent an escalation if Ukraine was to give it, was given mem a membership path, even membership at the next NATO summit? Um, I want your answer to be quick because there's a nuclear, burning nuclear question that will go to Marianne afterwards. Well, um, you, you point out all the reasons, and I think a very good job of pointing the other side of this, of this question. Uh, and it's not something that uh, uh, is black and white in terms of how do you do this. Um, NATO hasn't had to do an enlargement uh, move with this kind of complexity ever. And getting consensus within the alliance by itself will be tough. But I think, I think you have to approach it in a uh, more savvy way than we did in Bucharest in 2008. I think we have to, have to approach it in a way that's not going to put Ukraine in, in an even worse place, uh, which is what happened in 2008. I think the approach uh, needs to be one that provides deterrence for, you, for Ukraine. And it's got to be shaped in a way that might be different than it has been shaped in the past in terms of, of an extension of, a, of, of, of membership uh, to the, the past uh, newer allies. In Washington, I think we need to take a, a first step, and it's really a first step, uh, which is to, to invite them in for, uh, to invite them to membership. In other words, you don't bring them in immediately in, at Washington. You're now a member, and you're going to wave a magic wand, and, and there you go. Start a process. You've got to start the process, but it's got to be started in a real way. It can't be an empty process. It can't be an empty promise. We've had too much of that. This has got to be real. It can't be another committee. It can't be another Ukraine committee at NATO. It's got to be something that, that, that means that membership is, is, is coming, uh, and it's got to be done in a way that um, – that shows strength in NATO and unity in NATO that we've agreed to do this. The problem in Bucharest was there wasn't, you know, there wasn't a consensus there. There was mass confusion there, and the the Bush administration came in and pushed, uh, pushed an approach, uh, and uh, and it and it didn't work out as we know. The statecraft issues there. Washington, it can be done with more savvy, and I think it's got to be done with the strength of NATO unity. I don't think we have another choice. But we can do it in a way that helps us deal with the problems that you've laid out and, and that, that have been laid out here as well by my colleagues. So. Mariana, two questions. I want to throw them simultaneously. The first is a short one. Uh, is there still a real threat of nuclear escalation? We know that Biden administration has been cautious about escalation uh, on the Ukraine front. President uh, Biden talked about World War III. There's been caution in terms of uh, which, what weapons to provide, what range, what, et cetera. Um, and last year this time, there was also a real threat of nuclear escalation. People talked about the phone calls and uh, diplomacy. Do you still see a threat for nuclear escalation on the side of Russia? This one can be short. The real question I want to ask you is, how does this end? Oh, both easy questions. And sure. that was short, too. I've got it. Me have a couple. Um, before I very quickly answer um, your two questions, um, I'd like to weigh in on the previous debate just very briefly. Look, there's not that many options out there uh, for Ukraine security. There's, there's three things you could do. One is for Ukraine to become a Belarus, a satrapy of Russia, part of its, you know, sphere of influence, whatever, and follow that route. And that's the, the scenario Russia has been pursuing. It would very much like to do that. And to be honest, if Ukrainian publics were on board with that, I think the West would be just like, yeah, whatever, you know, it's their choice. The problem is Ukrainians, the public, staged two revolutions in order not to do it, two public massive protests, in 2004 and 2014, they're just not acquiescing to this scenario. No matter what people in Washington and Moscow want, Ukraine has an agency in all of this. Two is 
to become part of integrated European security architecture. And in that, there's NATO. There's really nothing else. Uh, with all due respect, EU security structures are basically non-existent uh, for all intents and purposes. So how this happens um, is a big um, you know, set of questions. Certainly, I agree with those who said that 2008 in Bucharest was a bane of half measures. It was the opposite of what was it Teddy Roosevelt advised us to, uh, you know, speak softly and carry a big stick. Uh, well, that was the opposite of that. Um, and the third solution for Ukraine security is to become this built-up, militarized garrison state, maybe follow an Israeli model where there, there is a strong alliance, bilateral alliance, say, with the United States, um, you know, but really just become this kind of very mobilized, you know, on the, on the territory of Ukraine. Does Europe want that? You know, we don't know. And even with the best efforts on Ukrainian part, can it still stand up to Russia that's like three times the size with, with all the resources? Could Ukraine have done better to provide for its security over the 30 years? Absolutely. Absolutely. But still with the best efforts, though, you know, uh, those, you know that, th those capacities would have been limited. Uh, with all that, is there um, a threat of nuclear escalation? Absolutely. When there is a hot conventional conflict uh, on the ground, uh, stakes are raised, um, you know, the, there's, there's definitely a, a heightened risk. Um, President Putin has used nuclear threats abundantly uh, for political effect. They seem to have worked. Because they seem to have worked, he continues to use them. Uh, they worked in the sense of inducing caution on the part of the West, not deterring at all, uh, you know, altogether Western support, but very cautious approach, salami tactics in terms of providing assistance, in terms of limiting end use and so forth. All of it very justified, but unfortunately costing a lot of Ukrainian lives in the meantime. And... Uh, um, uh, you know, and and actually hampering the 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 prospects for you for successful Ukrainian uh, counteroffensive, and that leads me to the question of how all of this ends. The short answer is we don't know. Nobody knows, right? The war a war is a war. It you know right now it could seem like a slog on you know, the Southern Front and near Robotna. Tomorrow we could be reading the news that the second line of defense is broken, Ukrainian troops are poured in, reserves are redeployed. You know, we don't know, uh, we don't know that. What it, it will end someday. And when it ends, the question of long-term security for Ukraine and for Europe will at be. large will, will have to be solved in a, such a way that none of this can happen again. So, Steve... One less than one minute, and then I have a quick question to Tara. Uh, you've talked about Israeli model. We have a, we've had a lot of questions from the audience. How does it end? What steps needs to be taken? What uh, you know? Do you envision peacekeepers, security guarantees? Uh, there's uh, specific questions to the Sam Sharp piece uh, that call, uh, that's called for in foreign affairs that has called for negotiations. Basically, uh, how does it end? Uh, all right, you gave me one, one minute. One minute, Steve. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, so I would favor uh, a combination of the Israel model, quote-unquote, very flawed analogy, but the Israel model, a well-armed, well-trained Ukraine with support from its international partners, including the United States, for arms and training, significant support, and integration into Europe. Um, but I don't favor NATO membership. Uh, I don't think there's any kind of savvy way to get the alliance on board because there are deep objections. We saw them come out in Vilnius and Washington and Berlin uh, to that course of action. But I'm really concerned by the idea that NATO membership is an alternative to, a, to the Israel model, to a well-armed, well-supported Ukraine. As if this piece of paper, Article 5, is going to provide security. Um, we need to learn something back to the League of Nations about that, right? Um, now, that may have worked uh, in the past three decades, um, quote unquote, because we don't actually know that but for NATO security guarantees, Russia would have invaded other countries. 
possibly, but we don't know. Um, but in the case of Ukraine, Ukraine is going to have to be well-armed, well-supported, and physically able to uh, deter Russia uh, through its capabilities, right? And so this NATO option, I worry that there's a kind of fantasy being created that NATO is the silver bullet, and then because of those words, it, this will never happen again. Well, I uh, have to apologize publicly to Tara because we're running out of time. Uh, there's China and there's Trump, possible next Trump administration that were Europeans that we would have liked to talk about. But alas, uh, a round of applause, please, for our panelists. And thank you all. Hello, everyone. We are actually not, I mean, feel free to get yourselves coffee, but we're actually not doing a break. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, we are on a tight schedule. Um, and if everybody sort of bunching on over there in front of the door could perhaps move their conversations elsewhere, <laughs> that would be really great. Okay. I am just going to start off. My name is Constanze Stolzenmüller. I run the Center on the U.S. and Europe. And um, we, um, I have assembled here a terrific panel, but before I introduce them, I want to give two shout-outs. One is to Stephen Wertheim, who Stephen joined us on the previous panel, which was terrific, uh, in the middle of his paternity leave, for which I'm extremely grateful, so thank you, Stephen. And the other one is to our colleague, Jim Goldgeier, who was also going to have joined us and who instead had to have a sort of very ben um, you know, benign medical procedure. Jim, if you're watching, get well. Um, and, you know, sorry you couldn't be with us. Um, with that, we have until 11.30 to discuss a not exactly minor issue uh, in, in this entire uh, scenario that we're facing until the, the end of the... What you were looking at me in horror, Norm. Were you thinking we had an hour... Fascination, more? not horror, okay, with good. our topic. I know, I know, I know. You're, I'm going to have to be... Um, Shall we say that with you three on the panel, especially you, Norm, knowing you, uh, this panel will sort of run itself, but I will attempt to impose a minimum of discipline, um, and you can all watch me fail as I do that. Anyway, what I will do is um, let me first introduce our panelist, Dr. Alina Polyakova, a former colleague of ours at uh, Brookings who... Um, unfortunately left us to run another institution, who knows why. Uh, she is the president and CEO of CEPA, the Center for European Policy Analysis, uh, uh, ana for European Policy Analysis, sorry, uh, which under her leadership, uh, shall we just say, has been doing absolutely terrific work. So congratulations to you on that. Um, Matthew Continetti is a journalist and senior fellow for, I have to read this off, Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at our neighbors, the American Enterprise Institute. Um, we're really grateful to have you here. We were just joking that we, here on the road, we have Brookings here, then Carnegie, and then AEI, and then across the road, size. of course, they're moving uh, to another part of town, who knows why, but we sort of aren't really in each other's houses enough. Right, and, and I think we need to do more of that. So this is an attempt to to keep that uh, to 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 keep that going. Um, I also just read in your Wikipedia bio that you have been sanctioned by Russia. Um, I am. Uh, curiously, I'm just curious to hear, Alina. You must Thank be you. sanctioned, and Norm, you must be sanctioned as well, right? Have I managed to get no? Uh, 
so many. I was, I was on the, the list of, uh, I think, 500 names that was announced awesome. earlier this year. Good I was you. very proud to be on that list. Yeah. I also like the fact that my name appeared ahead of Barack Obama's. <laughs> So well, I that I was mean, a nice way of I, I thought I might have a triple whammy. I don't understand why you're not sanctioned, Alina, but I'm sure in the fullness of time this will come about. After today's panel, it's inevitable. <laughs> They'll <laughs> issue an update. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and finally, I have next to me the absolutely inimitable and irrepressible Norm Eisen, uh, attorney, author. Or, since we've been flogging books, I just ripped this out of the hands of his assistant. This is Norm's uh, book, which got tremendous reviews and which, in fact, I have been meaning to get, and I will pay for it, I promise. I told her. You may have it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'll pay for it anyway. I hate, I hate you know, just ripping colleagues' books. Anyway, most importantly, Norm, Norm is not just a former U.S. ambassador to Prague. Um, he is also um, highly active in uh, the, the world of combating corruption uh, and disinformation, as, as, of course, is also Alina with, with her work. So we have a completely terrific panel. One last thing. Norm is also the insp inspiration for a character in a movie. He's the inspiration for a ca character in Wes Anderson's Budapest Hotel. That doesn't happen uh, to a lot of people. And again, my name is Constanze Stelzmüller. I run this center. The topic we want to talk about today is the nexus between politics and policy, because as we all know, we're running into a series now of key elections in Europe and in America, which we are already seeing constraining the foreign policy and foreign and security policy space. Um, and these are elections in Poland coming up on the 15th of October, then the European elections next spring, finally the, the US elections in November of next year, and not completely irrelevantly, a couple of German state elections, two in uh, October as well, uh, Hesse and Bavaria this year, and then in three eastern states where the alternative for Germany is trending extremely high, distressingly high, um, next fall, just before the US election. But we want to, and we want to focus, I think, first on, on these elections, but we also want to give some thought to the problems of governance, right? Of, of governance at a time of permanent disruptions, of seemingly intractable, unsolvable problems, right? Problems that aren't amenable to treaties. And, and see what we, where the, what these, these, the situation which puts a huge, huge stress on policymakers and publics alike, on institutions um, and on markets, uh, what, whether we can find any positive recommendations to make. Uh, as, to, as to how to make governance more shockproof in a time of political upheaval. And as we know, of course, this situation that I've just described empowers the extremists and the populists. Let me start first uh, with the elections because that is sort of the proximate source of stress and shock right now, as we are seeing. And I want to start with you, Alina. Um, I think we're probably all in agreement on this panel, even if we think that the hard left in our political spaces does silly stuff. Um, they are not about to change the constitutional order, right? I think the challenge I'm going to suggest that the challenge of the day is that the hard right in our political spaces across the transatlantic world is hell-bent on rewriting our constitutional orders, right? That is what is the... It is not just about, about culture wars, right? It is not just about economic inequality. It is about rewriting the rule books of our orders. And Alina, since you've just been in Europe and you've just been in Poland, do you want to perhaps give us a little bit of an impression of what, you, what, what is your take on what's going on in Europe and perhaps with an emphasis on Poland where you've just come back from? Thank well, you for joining us. Th thank you so much, Constanza. I, I, I feel so honored to be back at Brookings and uh, with Welcome. my esteemed you know colleagues. You here can get me. out, but you can never leave, <laughs> as the Eagles said. Hotel uh, Brookings. Well, I, I'm, 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 happy, I'm happy to be uh, an example of that uh, lack of escape. Um, Constanza, I'm very happy to go into this question, but please don't hate me for wanting to make one short comment uh, in relation to the debate that was on the last panel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I knew we were going to do that. Uh, I, could, I can't help myself because there was a discussion in the last panel about uh, NATO membership versus EU membership for Ukraine. Um, and I think it was maybe uh, St Stephen who said that uh, NATO membership is not a good idea. 
uh, by uh, EU membership would be. Uh, and I just want to point out that the, the whole idea that somehow uh, NATO enlargement had anything to do with Russia's aggression against Ukraine, um, I mean, just factually, it's wrong, frankly. Uh, and it was, in fact, EU membership and Ukraine's desire to join the EU, not NATO, uh, and not even to join, but to have a free trade agreement with the European Union in 2013 uh, that actually started uh, the revolution of dignity in Ukraine and then led to Russia's first military invasion of Ukraine in 2014 and the annexation of Crimea and the invasion of the Donbass. This said nothing to do with NATO. And in fact, support for NATO was so low that the likelihood of Ukraine joining was basically zero uh, until Russia annexed Crimea. So I just want to put that out there because I think when we're having this very heated debate now, because we're talking about human lives that are lost on a daily basis, now was just in Ukraine as well, uh, we have to be careful about how we revise history uh, to make convenient arguments. Um, Can I do a two-finger agreement the with that? We are, but it's okay. Um, I just published an analysis. I just published an analysis of Brookings GMF analysis of the role that supports uh, Alina's uh, insight of the role of corruption in the um, latest Putin aggression and the response to the crackdown of the oligarchs, which if you look at the regional sources was a clear economic motivation that has nothing whatsoever to do with NATO. So yes. it's another data point. I think it's overstated to say NATO's com membership is completely uh, unrelated. However, the uh, causal uh, connection Norm, a two is- finger does have to be short. You That's it. It was uh, one long run on sentence. I know, still. It was long. Alina, your right. turn. Uh, but, <laughs> but thank you for allowing us that uh, interjection, Constance. I think these are important things because um, these are not just theoretical geopolitical debates we're having. Um, as uh, Mariana rightfully said, um, there's people involved, there's people's agency involved. Uh, this isn't a chessboard. I think we often th like to have these geopolitical discussions as if there's a global chessboard uh, that those of us or the decision makers, not me, I have no responsibility uh, whatsoever for making me big decisions, but those uh, sitting in our capitals are just moving chess pieces around. Um, that's not what this is. This is about people and it's about their lives and about their livelihoods. And it's about our vital U.S. national security interest at the end of the day. Um, okay, all that being said, um, you know, Constanza, to your very good framing of, the, of this panel, um, you know, I think you're 100% right. Um, there is a, I would say, a new aspect to the politics of the extreme right. Um, I've been studying this topic for many years, for better or for worse, uh, and uh, you know, we've had a pattern in Europe for decades now where we've seen the emergence of far-right, nationalist, populist, whatever you want to call them, radical right political parties, uh, really since the 1970s. I think it feels to us that uh, this is all fresh and new happening at the same time, but uh, this has been a slow-burning process that is now really coming to light um, and starting to affect, I think, the governance of our democracies in profound ways. But you're right that this anti-institutionalism, a profound desire to dismantle democratic institutions from within, um, is a new hue uh, that we haven't seen before in such a concrete manner. Certainly there was authoritarianism, um, as part of far-right political parties' agendas, uh, but it looked quite different. Um, I think now the danger is that we are seeing in places like Hungary for many years now, uh, you know, well, Hungary is Hungary the original is a, model, isn't it, for exactly. many countries? Uh, Poland is different. I want to make that clear. Poland is not Hungary, but in many of these countries we're seeing electoral, democratic electoral rules being revised uh, for the purpose of undoing democracy, right? This is the great um, irony here. Um, and I think that is something for us to all be concerned about. And the pattern we've seen in the U.S. Uh, that plays out differently because we have a two-party system here. Um, it's, but it's one and the same. Um, it's similar arguments. The tools, uh, Norm and I wrote a report about this several years ago about how authoritarian and illiberal states, two reports, uh, learn from each other. Um, and the, the last report that we did together, it's a Brookings report too, called the Democracy Playbook, uh, actually lays out strategy for how to push back against these kinds of tools that uh, far-right and authoritarian leaders use. 
So to your point, Constanza, yes, you're right. Um, we are in a new era, I think, in many ways. Um, but uh, it's been something we just haven't paid attention to for a long time. Okay. I, that, that is a point I very much take, but I do want to sort of push back uh, on, on one question. I've been sort of trawling through the sort of analyses of, of the hard right, and it seems to me that there are sort of two versions of this story um, that I think are worth actually trying to pass. And, and one is, yes, there is a terrifying rise of the hard right um, across uh, the, the transatlantic space, the US and Europe, and traditional center-right parties are caving uh, when faced with this onslaught. And there's certainly evidence to, for that point, including in my country, including last night. Uh, some of you, perhaps, who read this kind of stuff as obsessively as I do, will know that in Thuringia, the CDU, the Liberals, and the AFD, all in the opposition, um, voted together on a property tra uh, transfer tax law against the governing red, red, green coalition government. Right? That's an astonishing thing at a time when we have, when we have elections coming up in two states which ought to be shoe-ins for the conservatives. The, arguably, um, the, the CDU is now in a very defensive position. But there is another, another version of the story, um, which is that all these, a lot of these populists, at least in Europe, um, have turned into post-populists, and this, the name that comes up most often is Giorgio Meloni in Italy, and that they are actually showing to be relatively transatlanticist, that they are pro-European, and they are sort of trying to play within the system and within the rules. Which of these is true? I think both are true, honestly, because I think every country is slightly different, has a slightly different um, political environment. You know, Poland, for example, to go to your, to your question, Constanza, there's elections happening in just a few weeks in Poland. Mm -hmm. uh, I this morning looked at the, at the recent polling. Um, but what's interesting here is the effect of the far right emergence. Um, in most European countries, they are not majority parties. Let's remember that. The AFD in Germany um, is not part of the ruling coalition. Um, or the, the UMPL coalition, they, they won't be most likely based on, on polling, but they're certainly gaining steam. But I think the effect has been as though we've seen across much of Western Europe, Northern Europe, um, is a, the effect has not been that these parties take over and institute their agenda, for the most part. Italy, I think, is in a different category. But what they do do is they basically push the entire political spectrum to the right, because the center-right what accounts for the profound collapse of the center-right in many European countries? One of those factors is that they are trying to pander to the far-right, trying to take up the agenda of the far-right, uh, and as a result, they're actually losing voters because nobody wants to vote for the copy. They want to okay. vote for the original. Um, and as a result, they're actually feeding and legitimizing the far-right agenda rather than electorally being able to uh, succeed and do better than the far-right. And that's in, in Poland, this has been so profound. You know, in Poland, we have an incredibly important election coming up. And some have called it, uh, certainly the opposition, the, the left or the, the center-left opposition, uh, the civic platform, Platforma, has called this uh, the most significant election since 1989. But what is even... Platform are doing, and they're, they're pulling far behind the ruling party, Pease, um, and that gap is widening now. Um, they are co-opting anti-immigration rhetoric. They're co-opting populism, um, the idea, for example, to double uh, payments for children and, and family support. Uh, these are all the agenda of, of the right that's been there for some time. And they're losing support as they, as they turn further and further to the right. But I think this is the profound effect that we've had. We had weak coalitions, a shift to the right, um, and really a profound inability in many European countries to govern. Because when you have a weak... We will, that, that's a point we will also come to, that, exactly. because that's, that's a very real issue. I will just say, to your point of the AFD not uh, being unlikely to enter into coalition, that, that's, that is right. I mean, again, uh, forgive me if I sort of exceed my role as moderator here, but, but while many of the hard right parties in Europe have been, um, as we say, eating chalk, in other words, pr pr pretending at the very least... Uh, to be pragmatic, and perhaps some of them are finding a need to be pragmatic in the constraints of a constitutional order they can't change quickly, um, the AFD has actually radicalized in full sight, right? But it is trending in the 30s, 
in eastern Germany. And the luck of this current German coalition government is that those eastern, uh, eastern German state elections aren't until next year. But let me just say this. There are three elections in eastern Germany, in Thuringia, Brandenburg, and Saxony, and the AFD is trending there at, I think, 34 and 37% which is terrifying. What that means was if, the, if, if they, uh, a, a, any, any democratic government that was created against that kind of a political force would have to be at least a three-way coalition, if not a four-way coalition. Again, complicating the, the problems of governance and, of course, creating legitimacy problems um, given faced with such an enormous and an entrenched opposition. I'm going to come to you, Matthew, now, if I may. Matthew, um, you've written this, this book last year, The American Right, which I uh, didn't bring on my, on my desk at home, but which I commend that everybody read. Um, but describe to us, and perhaps to also to the European audience li- listening on, online, um, what the battle lines uh, in the GOP are right now, especially sort of given my contention, um, where you can correct me or, or agree with me, uh, that that the the real problem the, or the the most severe problem here is is this desire to change the nature of the of the constitutional order. Sure. <clears throat> well, thank you for having me. For joining it's us. A yeah. Pleasure to be here. I think it was Norman Podhoritz who said the longest journey in the world is the journey from Brooklyn to Manhattan. I now know that the longest journey in the world is from AEI <laughs> yeah. to Brookings. <laughs> I want to take a step back, though, because your opening conversation is very interesting to me. It seems to me that when we go back seven years ago and we look at kind of the emergence of national populism around the world, we could have referred to something as the, uh, the nationalist international. There's all of these various national populist parties uh, seem to share a certain agenda. They were all responding to social change within their societies. They were all resp- responding to migration. They all were against kind of international institution building, whether it was the EU or skeptical of NATO here in the United States. And they all seemed to have a very fond view of Vladimir Putin and of Viktor Orban. But to your point, Constanza, it seems to me that now it seems we have to disaggregate this nationalist international. So Maloney is not Orban. She's not PIS, right? Um, None of them are Trump, because he has his own unique set of problems. Uh, Le Pen is different than AFD, right? Maybe she'll be a slightly different political phenomenon depending on how uh, she does. So I think it's important to take a step back and see how these movements are maybe fracturing, fracturing and diverging from each other in very subtle ways. Um, on the rulemaking, you know, it is striking to me that in the, the American national populist movement sees itself as actually defending the Constitution of the United States. It is striking that even when they attempted to overturn the 2020 election, Trump enlisted John Eastman to figure out, well, maybe there's some legal loophole in the Constitution that allows the vice president to throw out the electoral votes. Even there, they saw themselves as kind of upholding a certain vision of what the Constitution is. Um, And it seems to me, in the American context anyway, many of the structural changes, the rewriting of the rules that are being proposed are actually coming from the American left and the progressive side of things, whether that's court enlargement, whether that's the addition of new states, whether that's abolishing the Electoral College. So I think that's an important distinction to keep in mind. But also, finally, just to address your your question, what is the state of play? I think the easiest way to understand the state of play in the Republican Party is that today, according to the Real Clear Politics average of polls, national populist candidates or national populist light candidates currently hold about 84% of the Republican electorate. That's Donald Trump's lead is up to 60% of the electorate. Number two is Ron DeSantis, who may be the Maloney-like figure, perhaps, or the best that can be hoped. Um, He is about 13%. And then Vivek Ramaswamy, rounding it at 9%. This, that to me, says that the Republican Party is a fundamentally different creature than it was when I arrived in Washington, D.C. two decades ago, a generation ago. And I just finally... And my remarks here by saying that, you know, it's not unusual for parties 
in America to go through these types of changes. And in fact, one of the themes of my book, The Right, is that the Republican Party and conservatism has gone through a sequence of development beginning in the 1920s. So Calvin Coolidge Republicanism was different than Robert Taft Republicanism in the interwar period. Robert Taft Republicanism was different than Barry Goldwater Republicanism. Goldwater's Republicanism and conservatism was different than Ronald Reagan's. And certainly now, Donald Trump has effected a change in American conservatism and the Republican Party uh, that, whether we like it or not, and I mostly dislike it, <laughs> cannot, be denied, cannot be denied. Let me, Matthew, let me perhaps come back at you on, on two points. One is I just want to point out that while I agree with you that Maloney and Le Pen sort of sound different today, uh, they, of course, have splinter hard right parties right, that are attacking them for having become too moderate, right? There is Matteo Salvini and the Lega in Italy. Uh, um, the uh, niece of, of Marine Le Pen, Marion Maréchal, uh, is, I think, also uh, tacking to a much harder position than, than, than her aunt is, um, and so on. You have that everywhere. In Poland, of course, you have a Confederacja and with Zbigniew Jobro, uh, the justice minister, who have a much more hard-edged ethno-nationalist turn than, than their own government, right? Um, so let me come back at you and say, because you, the last chapter of your book emphasizes the importance of the Constitution so much as an ordering framework that is all we need to refer to to bring America back on course, right? I mean, I applaud that. I wrote my doctoral thesis on, on American constitutional law. So, German doctoral thesis. And I, and I have immense respect for this document and for its vitality, despite its extraordinary age. But I, I, I would say to you, and the point where I want to push back is that we're seeing now, in, at this juncture, um, people who are very deliberately, intentionally trying to rewrite the framers' intent in ways that are specifically ethno-nationalist, right, uh, unitarian and populist. In other words, that are against, that, that somehow negate foundational principles of the American Constitution, such as uh, the, the, the separation and the balance of powers and the, the, essentially the protection of political pluralism. And I'm thinking quite specifically of the sort of school of thought and a sort of organizational movement created by Yoram Hazoli and Ophir Havivri, Havivri um, with Yoram Hazoni with his book, The Virtue of Nationalism, which in 2018 not just got a lot of prizes in the conservative you know, side of the aisle, but in fact uh, was uh, said to be the inspiration for Pompeo's famous speech in Brussels uh, that the EU needed to be, to be disbanded because it sort of violated the, the, the rules of, of you know, sane and healthy nationalism. Um, there are, of course, you know, there are all these rumors flying about of uh, the hard right sort of organizing, you know, creating, you know, not, not, not just its own media houses, it's, you know, uh, capturing its own think tanks. We all know who they are. It's not yours. Um, uh, I mean, this is one of the other signs of the age, right, is a sort of ordering, a sorting of the, of the think tanks on the, on the American center right here in Washington. Um, but how, how seriously is, are the fears of a much more organized, uh, much more hard-edged, and much more competent mm -hmm. hard right coming to power in this country, mm -hmm. are those overblown or are they justified in your view? Well, just to comment first on this national conservative movement, kind of the most energetic and influential part of the national populist yeah. movement in the United States. This was organized, ironically, the leading advocates of uh, national conservatism in the United States are Israelis and Hungarians. Um, but uh, Yoram Hazoni, the political theorist, is responsible for organizing this group. They put out a statement last summer, which I thought was remarkable because it uh, clearly um, either ignored, elided, or uh, violated tenets of American constitutionalism and certainly the principles of the Declaration of Independence. I think what's important as we look at what's happening on the American right today is we have to dis make a distinction between theoretical intellectual arguments and populist movement as it expresses itself in the politics of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. Some of the comments in that manifesto of national conservatism concerning, say, the place of religion in society, essentially endorsing 
state religion in the United States, I do not think will, would actually be accepted by most Republican voters. Um, it's other things about federalism basically kind of papered over in this statement. You know, federalism is good until it results in something we dislike. Again, I think many, many voters, Republican, center-right voters, even populist, hard-right voters, would kind of say, well, we like having the freedom of the states. So I think we have to, a perfect example of this was in the reaction to this uh, viral song, Rich Men North of Richmond, by the country artist Oliver Anthony. I loved this episode because Oliver Anthony, a working class man out of a Richmond suburb, does this song about how the, the rulers of the United States, the political establishment, is ruining this country and violating the rights of the working man. And it's immediately taken up by the national populist right in, in America. And it's Oliver Anthony, he's the, the new mascot of Trumpism. And then they actually got to talking to Oliver Anthony, and he said, oh, I, don't, I love immigration. Diversity is our strength. Um, <laughs> uh, by the way, the government is not the solution to the problem for all those people on the hard right thinking that industrial policy and protection is. So he, of course, is more representative of actual Americans. Mm. And the thing about America is we have this folk libertarianism ingrained into our being that I think would prevent us from wholeheartedly endorsing all of the tenets of national conservatism. Your words in God's ear. Um, I mean, it is also true that something very similar obtains in Poland, right? Uh, the, the general obstreperousness and vitality of Polish civil society, I think, is, is something that um, is, is something that one can rely on in most moments. But uh, with that, I want to come to Norm Eisen, um, who's staring at me intently, uh, which is terrifying. Um, Norm, My I was deposition wondering... tactic. Yes, That's I'm how sure I soften up the right, witnesses. You know what, but you know what? I'm a lawyer, too, and <laughs> we can play that game, both of us. Anyway, um, darling, we were going to talk about the linkages between, at least uh, what you suggested to me in an email. I mean, I'm sure you have comments about everything that's been said before, but don't. Um, we were going to talk about the linkages between the U.S. right and the European right and, and, and perhaps also their connections to uh, sort of nefarious uh, other actors um, from, from outside our political spaces. So have at it. I have. Uh, thank you, Constanza. And thank you to the Center on the United States and Europe uh, for inviting me to be here. I was so excited to uh, really join to your, you. your kickoff panel. It's so wonderful to be back with my co-author and friend, Alina. We've traveled together with the rest of our group uh, that wrote those two reports. First, we analyzed these linkages in a report. The Did we call it the illiberal play toolkit? Yeah. Then we analyze the solutions. I'm mindful that you started by asking for solutions. I know we'll do that in the next round in the democracy playbook, which has gone through two editions. Um, I, I have a new piece up just this morning on um, uh, the both the um, uh, anatomy of the linkages, but also an example of the very conscious nature of the effort to build linkages, which is Tucker Carlson's recent interview with Viktor Orban. With, with Carlson's eviction from Fox News, um, a result of the healthy operation of U.S. rule of law, which has seen us through the populism crisis, that constitution that you uh, wrote about, analyzed, and spoke about so admiringly for all of its age, is holding up uh, well. Um, he's been ousted from Fox News, but this um, he does his interviews now on... Uh, X, the platform formerly known as Twitter, and it should be X-rated for uh, democracy uh, content because um, uh, it's a very startling example of the uh, of both the 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 theoretical structure of the linkages and the effort to build bridges. Part of the reason, and it got 128 million views. Now, every time somebody clicks on that video, 
I clicked on it 10 times myself to write this essay just because I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Um, that is a view. So it's not saying he got an audience of 128 million people, but he got is getting millions and millions of people who are in this, you know, this vexed 30%, the 30-something who support Trump, um, the uh, in the rise of German fascism, there was never a poll in which the National Socialists got more than the low 30s. You've pointed out the AFD polling. That 30% number, as you all know, is much more perilous in the parliamentary government. If you look at the support uh, for Netanyahu, it's no, in analyzing this, we can't ignore this, like the revolutions of 1848, this spreading zeitgeist that I'm going to now lay out the dimensions of. Uh, the Netanyahu um, new, the new face of Netanyahu, that's, you know, you, you come to this magic uh, 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 sub-majority metric over and over again. Uh, in the United States, because of that constitutional structure, it's perilous, uh, but not existential. In if, if the AFD polls this way, I think that's an existential threat for the functioning of German democracy. So, um, so what are those? Oh, and then on this, before I turn to the elements of the linkage, this kind of diplomacy of the far right, um, it is no coincidence that Steve Bannon, one of the intellectual godfathers of this uh, Trumpist far-right movement in the United States, opened the first outpost of Breitbart in Israel because the ethno-nationalism, and I proudly proclaim, proclaim, proclaim myself to be a liberal American Zionist, um, uh, uh, but the the this uh, Yoram Hazoni idea is very has found very fertile ground, particularly because in Israel there is legal protection. You don't have separation of church and state. You have the forced marriage of church and state, uh, synagogue and state, uh, which is what uh, Orban is reaching for. Polish. Catholic ideology infuses the political ideology there. And you see that that is a very important. Alina and I have written a lot about Erdogan. That's a very, the, the, the anti Ataturk, uh, neo Islamicist uh, elements of Erdogan's ideology. So, uh, uh, what, does, what else does this um, commonality contain? I'll say it briefly. I owe Alina for my two-finger intervention, which became a full fist, if not more. Uh, uh, I'll say what those elements, some of those elements are, and we've analyzed them in depth in our papers, Alina and I, and it's in this Just Security long essay on the Orban-Tucker uh, alliance. And Orban is, of course, one of the most frequent visitors to the United States, and he's come to CPAC, and U.S. far right, it's a mandatory to kiss or Bond's ring. Uh, it's a mandatory visit. Um, they attack uh, the core pillars of the liberal state. And there is uh, an assault in the first instance because it can be the softest uh, of those pillars on the free press. It is very easy using uh, libel, intimidation. You get a hold of the levers of the criminal uh, system when you take power. You don't even need to prosecute. Well, we remember the term enemies of the people. Right? The you company. don't even need to prosecute. Just investigate. So first an attack on the pre free press, a criminal um, uh, criminalizing that. Then you, uh, you move to uh, attack free and fair elections. Again, we saw that in the United States. It's, uh, there's ways you can use your power to start constraining the electoral space. Then as you consolidate more power, attack the judicial system because like elections, like the free press, it's another break on autocracy. Um, two last points. Um, I will um, uh, uh, take exception 
uh, uh, Constanza to the idea that there, uh, there's an ambiguity in your phraseology of rewriting the constitutional order. And Matthew also in pointing out, uh, the, fairly pointing out some of the uh, things that the left wants to do. I'll say that what John Eastman did was not rewriting. It was not restructuring. It was not even Orban's uh, holding a plebiscite to change the Constitution using the supermajority he's accumulated through, the, through attacking those independent breaks on autocracy. Um, what John Eastman did was throw out the constitutional order. There is no constitutional warrant. That was what was so shocking to me about the Trump assault of 2020, uh, which is now going to be on trial because one of the principal architects, Ken Chesbro, um, is going to be on trial in, in a, less than two months on October 23rd on this precise question. It is nowhere in the U.S. constitutional order to say that the vice president's ministerial role can suspend Congress or substitute the loser for the winner or send it back to the states to turn over their elections, the choice of their people, and sub uh, in state legislatures. So this is it's not really, rewriting. really important point that you make here. And there's one that actually was spared in a, in a really important and incisive book by our other colleague, Jonathan Rauch, The Constitution of Knowledge, which is that one of the most startling and, um, you know, frankly, terrifying aspects of this new period of, 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 you know, outright frontal challenge of existing orders is, is the, the insistence of people like Trump and others that they have the power to say what the truth is, right? And that so many people will follow them in that because the mere fact that a number of other or, or large groups of other people say that that is not their truth um, is something they consider as empowering them to, re to rebellion, right? That, that is, I, and, and that is also something that I think I'm seeing in Europe and especially in this German debate now about Bavaria, about the, the free voters and the things that I did or did not say as a 17-year-old. Sorry, I'm not going down that rabbit hole. I do, I do want to sort of push you on one point, Norman, then, but you know, we're already heading towards the end here. I'm a terrible moderator. Um, I, we'll I, moderate I, the moderator. <laughs> the, a critical uh, question in every democracy. Norm, obviously. Um, the question of international linkages right, between, between the hard right. Um, I mean, the, the aforementioned Yoram Hazoni has been tra trying to take his National Conservatism Conference to Europe. He took it to London. The porting of that was, frankly, somewhat mixed, right? The Brits were, I think, to some degree, bemused by what these people were trying to do here. Um, is it... Are we, are we overreacting when we are saying we need to, there is something like a hard right umma out there, right? Or are the interests, concerns, obsessions of the hard right so parochial that ultimately their, their connections are tenuous um, and, and not, not that important? I would actually like very brief intervention from all three of you if, on if this. I could Let me start with Alina and then, and then Matthew. Thanks for that. And as a way of responding directly to your question, very good question, Constanza, I wanted to really emphasize something that you said, Matthew, in your, in your opening comments about the transformation of, of the Republican Party in the United States. I think one of the biggest things I hear from European colleagues um, is that uh, this may be wishful thinking that Trump as a person is the problem. Yeah. And that once Trump at some point is off the political scene, you know, we're going to go back to the Republican Party of Reagan. And I'm constantly telling them, like, exactly what you said. Uh, look at DeSantis, look at Ramaswamy, look at who is coming up on the bench, in the bench. Uh, the Republican base has been transformed. It's not, and I don't think there's a return that I can see. You know this better. But I don't think there's a return. I think really getting this into the minds of other partners, allies, especially in Europe, is going to be key because I don't get the sense they're fully prepared for what is a long-term transformation and a realignment in our politics here and what that might mean for them in terms of foreign policy. Um, so I just wanted to, to buttress that a little bit. But Constanza, to your question, is, is there you know, a, a sort of living international entity here um, or are we uh, over overestimating the relationships and the alignment between all of these far-right groups. Um, I remember in uh, 2014, when I 
a year after I finished my doctoral uh, work on the emergence of the far right in Europe um, and what that meant for politics, uh, I wrote a paper <laughs> looking at the links between Russia and Europe's far right political parties. We've seen a lot of evidence of that come to light since then, okay? Um, and uh, nobody wanted to publish that paper because they said, oh, who cares? You know about this topic. These are just little, last words. Little, little parties, uh, and they're irrelevant in European politics. Mm. And all these little meetings they're having in Moscow or wherever in Russia uh, don't matter, right? That paper did get published, so in the World Affairs Journal eventually. Uh, but that was that was the view, and that has been the view. So I think if now we're sitting here, we may not know the full linkages. Those are very hard things to figure out from an investigative research perspective. We may not know the full breadth of it, but you know, trust you me, this has been building for a very long time. The relationships are there. Uh, now we're seeing, you know, we see the Tucker, we see the big pictures. We see Tucker Carlson you know, making his uh, overtures to Orban and vice versa. This is the tip of the iceberg. We don't know what's below. We really don't. But it's deep and it's profound. All right, that's a call to research, obviously. Matthew? I would say um, there are two broad thematic uh, linkages. Uh, one is the politics of migration. I mean, there's no question to me when I look at the history of the last 15 years that migration has been driving um, the, the, the right and the hard right uh, to embrace uh, not only stringent border controls but different immigration restrictions. And it also empowers hard right and right politicians throughout the Western world uh, and beyond because electorates are responding negatively to migrant inflows. And the second uh, thematic unity I would mention is what I'd call the politics of cultural despair, taking off of a very famous monograph about interwar yeah. Germany. Politics of cultural despair, the sense that every part Every piece of the commanding heights in your society is working against you. Mm. So for the Republicans and conservatives in the 20th century was the idea that big government, Leviathan, is against us. The judiciary is against us. But we have uh, the media is against us. And Hollywood is against us. But we do have small businesses and the free economy working for us. That is our one institutional support. The problem over the last 10 years, and especially the last three years, is that that final support of business is now seen to have been captured by the left, only amplifying the sense of cultural despair. And when you think that all of the institutions that govern your society have the intent purpose of destroying your way of life and do not care about mechanisms of democratic accountability, you will look for outside disruptors to, re to refit the system. And I find that is what's been happening in advanced democracies, All right. including we are, our own. We, we are sort of clearly at a point where we could go on doing this for three hours. Sadly, we're at the end point. So I'm going to ask you, all three of you, for a final word. And I apologize to the audience um, for not taking questions. I'm an idiot. Um, Norm, let me, let me go to you and say, what then is the response of sort of democratic forces? What should be the response of democratic forces in our societies? There are, there are two poles here, right? There is the, the poll that is called Wehrhafte Demokratie in German, was actually developed by a German Jew who, who, fled, to, who, who fled to America. Uh, defensive democracy, uh, and that would consist of things like surveilling and ultimately perhaps forbidding hard right movements. Um, there is another poll which says, actually, you know what, this is all, as, as you were suggesting, Matthew, this is all the fault of a, the, the unresponsiveness and the unrepresentativeness of establishment democratic forces, right? And, and they, in fact, need to change their way of, uh, they, they need to become more responsive and more representative. Otherwise, this is a foregone conclusion. Where, where, what's your take on this? And I will go with this question to all three of you. Both polls. Uh, I think you have to furiously defend the modes of democracy. One, one of those two polls is about the processes of democracy. In the United States, because of the constitutional order, it's not going to involve banning speech, unlike, say, in Germany, where Holocaust denial... Hate speech can be hate speech, can be banned. But what you can do is fight furiously on that poll, and I'll be very tight. 
Uh, there's a big debate that goes on in democratic uh, policymaking here, small d democratic policymaking, about how hard to fight. Many people told me, even though Alina and my research was to the contrary, don't impeach Trump because um, um, it, it, will, um, it will not work uh, and you'll just make the situation worse. But that is not what the political science teaches us. You need to sound the alarm. I would argue that that first impeachment set the template. By the way, Donald Trump agrees. He tweeted about this and me last week, uh, a list of resentments that starts with that impeachment. It set the template for the democratic accountability that's happening now through the criminal justice system. I wrote a whole book about that argument. You can agree or disagree. But on the other side, we must also have the substance of democracy. Democracy must deliver for the people because if it doesn't, you will get into the uh, problems, the policy problems of migration, uh, of um, uh, cultural disaffection, and the rest, unless there's a vibrant, it can't just be about what we're against. We have to be for an affirmative, prosperity-based vision of democracy. Matthew. Uh, I can only speak in the American context, but uh, from my point of view, the, the we must work to strengthen the structures of American constitutionalism. I think they were able to prevent the worst outcome in 2020, and I think that they, if buttressed and supported, will prevent the worst outcome in 2024. I will say, longer term, in America, it is very hard for a Republican Party that has been reduced to a national populist rump to win a national election. And so the long-term solution is somehow able to reconnect the Republican grassroots with, with business, with the type of institutional elites who used to provide a policy agenda and also to provide a positive attitude for populist thought rather than a negative, anti-institutional, almost nihilistic attitude, which we can see so often today. Alina? I'm going to... And an optimistic note, which is not my usual style, but uh, we are in a moment of darkness in many ways. But I think we have a tremendous opportunity because of Russia's brutal war against Ukraine. Because at the end of the day, Russia's war against Ukraine was about preventing a country from becoming a democracy mm -hmm. um, in the truest sense of the word, which is exactly where Ukrainians want to go. Um, and President Biden has said as much. And I think for years we've seen this decline in the belief in democracy among young people, um, certainly here and across Europe, in some of the best democracies in terms of transparency and electoral institutions and all of that um, in the world. You know, the, the, the Nordics come to mind, of course. Uh, but I think now the, there's a moment where people are not taking the freedom that democratic societies allow for granted anymore. Exactly. Certainly not in Europe. Yeah. And I think this is a real moment for us to really capture the imagination, particularly of the next generation, because you know, all of us sitting here, I don't want to age myself too much, uh, but we're aging out, you know. And I'm very proud to say that, you know, we have a ton of incredible young people in my organization, SEPA, where we can really, I really see the motivation and enthusiasm. And that is being replicated in countries across Europe. So I think it's time for us in the West to switch how we learn, right? To switch it away from saying, we're going to impart democracy in new countries of, uh, you know, the new democracies of Europe or wherever, and start to learn how they have been fighting the fight on the ground and how they're not taking it for granted anymore, because we still are in this country. Um, I, I'm going to give, agree with you on that optimistic note. This is a dark moment, and it's in many ways a dangerous one, but it is also one that is forcing us to return to first principles and to understand what really matters and what are distractions, right? And I think that's good. Having skated through much of that period, uh, the miraculous period post-1989-1990, when we thought progress was going to be linear, and, and we had been given a gift that we all deserved and that the future would be rosy and wonderful, right? We now know that many of governmental choices, but also public choices, must be, will be tragic, 
uh, but that we have things that are worth fighting for. With that, I want to, ch I want to thank not just my really terrific panelists, but also the people who made this happen and who make, on any given day, make me look like I know what I'm doing, uh, which is uh, not just my colleagues at CUSE, but uh, our assistant director, Ted Reinert, our center coordinator, Sophie Grasmuk, and our research assistant, senior research assistant, Sophie Rose, who um, helped organize this event and made it happen. I want to thank uh, the people in our organizing, uh, our people who, who help us put this all together, Adriana Peter, Harold Dorling, and Dan Lawrence, who uh, help us um, put events on the stage and make the AV and the and the audio technology work. And above all, I want to thank all of you for sticking with us, those of you in this room and those of you online. Um, it's been great to have you here. I'm sure we'll continue these conversations, which are incredibly important. And I would ask you at the end just to remain seated until we're gone out, um, and, and then you um, f feel free to leave. But I think there might also still be coffee outside. Thank you so much for coming to this important day. Thanks. <laughs>